to Shannon Levin, your friendly librarian, and I'm back with some book love. Let's chat. <sighs> How does this happen? Once again, things have kind of gotten a little bit out of control, and I am leaving tomorrow for a week at the beach with my cousin, so I'm going to get in some book chats before we go. Since I'm standing up, you probably know that I've got too many stacks going on to be able to sit down and chat. So give me just a second and I will move the stacks down and we'll get started. But I have a stack of books that I've read since the last time we talked. I have a stack of books that I have recommended or mentioned in videos, but I haven't really given you an in-depth talk about. So I wanted to do that today if I can. I have a stack of books that I added some recommendations for and I have a big list on my uh, short stack to be read. So we'll see how far we go. I am not going to make a three hour video like I did last time. I will cut it down and talk to you about some of the ones that I've added for recommendations or something at a different time if I need to, but we're gonna get another video out. I am really excited to talk to you about some of the books that I have just finished. Um, I just finished one before I even started this video, Daisy Jones and the Six. So I'll dabble in it a little bit today, but I've not really done enough of the background work to give you like an in-depth talk about it. But you know what? Go ahead and reserve that puppy because the audio is fabulous. So I'll talk to you about that, but I'm going to do these in order. So the books that I finished since the last time we talked, um, Springs of Devotion, just a little devotional book. I finished that. Our book club did David McCullough's The Pioneers. I read another uh, devotional, Love Does, by Bob Goff. So I'm going to talk to you about that. Kate Carlisle, remember I'm one of Kate's raiders, so she sent me this book for free um, the very end of June. Uh, it is Little Black Book. It's one of her cozy mysteries, so of course I'm always excited to talk to you about Kate's books. I read this little bitty 4th of July raid. I almost didn't include it, but you know what? I read it because I have it here and I just wanted, I just wanted to do it. So I'm going to include it. It's good. Um, another good devotional. I had no idea. Why didn't I see that pattern? Lord, teach me to study the Bible in 28 days by Kate Arthur. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about that. And then, oh my gosh, Mexican Gothic. Mexican Gothic by Sylvia Moreno Garcia. It's a lot. These are just the physical ones. So as I'm moving down the list, I've got a couple to mix in there that were either audio or eBooks that I don't have a copy to show you, but I'm going to talk to you about those. But I'm telling you, you're going to want to put some of these on your list. When I finished that last video, I was really worried because I filmed like all day. I'm a teacher and it's summer and I set everything up and I had not filmed for about a month and I just sat down and I just wanted to talk books and I did. I talked books for hours and I could only edit it down to three hours and I thought this is this is ridiculous like I can't keep making these really long videos no one's gonna watch these and you did so I really appreciate it I after I was editing it and I, I was like do I cut it in half and do two different videos or do I just throw it out there I thought you know what I just finished an audiobook that was 10 hours long <laughs> So I don't really care if a book is two hours long or if it's 10 hours long. It doesn't matter because I'm usually listening to something like this or turning it on to my TV, the YouTube, um, or I'm sitting out on the back porch and I'm watching YouTube videos out there. So wherever I am, I'm usually doing something else while I'm listening. So I'm assuming that you might be that way too. So I just threw it out there to the universe. <laughs> I was so tired from doing the whole thing in editing that I forgot to add in any intro music and all that. And you have to do that in a certain section. And I thought, I'm, it's gone. Like, <laughs> here is my book love. We're discussing and I'm throwing it out to the universe. My purpose is to hopefully help you find something that you want to read or you want to talk about and to get all that book love out there. That, that's my purpose. So whether that is a 40 minute video or a three hour video, it doesn't seem to matter. You don't seem to mind either way. So I really appreciate you. Um, you know why I'm doing this. I've talked about it in other videos and it's like book therapy and I love it. And I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to discuss books. So thank you for taking me along while you're driving on your commute or while you're cleaning or puttering around the house or if you just sit down at the end of the day and you want somebody who's going to talk to you about books, I'm your gal. So thanks for following along. All right, so the last video I did talk to you about someone mentioning, um, you know, you should start a book club. Well, I did 23 years ago, but it's a real one and it's a traditional one. So I am going to start a book club with this YouTube channel. Well, I'm just going to throw it out there and we'll see what happens. So. 
So I'm gonna do that. I'm going to create a Facebook group and I will put that information in the notes below. I will let you know what is on my short stack, what I plan to be reading, so that you can read that along with me and there can be a little bit more of a discussion. I would love that. I'm not sure what that's gonna look like, but we're gonna try it. All right, so first book, it's a doozy. This is not gonna be one of those books like Wonder where I'm like, every human being should read this book. This is not a every human being should read this book. This is for us weirdos only. <laughs> um, I, when I saw this cover last summer, I think it was, it was a really hot book and I saw the, the cover and it has the word gothic in it. And um, I just kept hearing book chatter, book chatter, book chatter. And I thought, I really wanna read that book. And it's taken me forever to finally get to it. My friend, Stephanie Erickson, bought the book, read it, and then loaned it to me. Um, on NetGalley right now, I have Sylvia Marino Garcia's next book, The Velvet Something. So that's on my list of reading next week while I'm, you know, reading off my Kindle um, and trying not to pack too much. Um, so she read it and she was like, mm, it's a weird one. It is definitely a weird one, which is the book chatter that I heard. And I'm okay. I love weird books. I'm okay with that. Um, but whew, it's a weird one. And I loved it. I loved every minute of it. Um, you get a lot of comments out there if you're looking at the book chatter where people are like, oh, I'm 50 pages in. What is going on? I don't know if I really like this book or not. You know what? If you don't like it, this is one you might want to DNF. Just do not finish and set it aside. It might not be your cup of tea and that's perfectly fine. Do not waste time, you know, reading a book that you're not enjoying. Just don't, don't waste time doing that. Um, and the other thing is like, depending on where you are in your reading journey, you know what you're gonna like and when you're not. And when I read to you part of this little book flap, you're gonna be like, oh, or uh -huh. okay? So here we go. After receiving a frantic letter from her newlywed cousin, Nomi Taboda, I have no idea if I'm saying that right because I did read the print, I did not listen to the audio, heads to High Place, a distant house in the Mexican countryside, unsure of what she'll find. Nomi is an unlikely rescuer. She's a glamorous debut debutante, more suited to cocktail parties than amateur sleuthing. But she's also tough, smart, and not afraid. Not of her cousin's new English husband, a stranger who's both menacing and alluring. Not of his father, the ancient patriarch who seems fascinated by Nomi. And not even by the house itself, which begins to invade Nomi's dreams with visions of blood and doom. Nomi's only ally in this inhospitable place is the family's youngest son, but he too may be hiding something dark. For there are many secrets behind the walls of High Place, as Nomi discovers when she begins to unearth stories of violence and madness. Mesmerized by this terrifying yet seductive world, Nomi may find it impossible to save her cousin or even escape this enigmatic house. Now the house is a definite character in this story. It is a gothic tale, okay? So it's a little gory. It's a little gruesome at times. It's a lot gruesome at times. So if that's not part of anything that you like, this one is not for you. But if you like to be a little freaked out, if you like to be a little um, perplexed by what's happening, if you're okay, and I can't even tell you, I should just like go over there and pull off all the books that are like this. If you're okay getting to the middle of a book and still not being sure what's going on, this is the book for you. But I know that I have a lot of students who I teach high school. If you've watched any of my other videos, I teach high school, mainly freshmen and seniors. I have a lot of students that when they are reading, if they get to page 20 and they don't have the story, they're not in for it, right? So this is one of those books. You're perplexed. You have some ideas. There's a lot of foreshadowing. There's clues that are thrown in there. But quite frankly, you can't even imagine <laughs> what um, Sylvia Marino Garcia has thought up for how to end this book. It's one of those books that when you are three quarters of the way through, you're like, how the heck is she going to get out? How's it gonna happen? Um, I know in one of my previous videos, I talked to you about the woman, no, the wife upstairs. And I remember like that, it's based on Jane Eyre. And I remember like, I was at least three quarters of the way through and I'm thinking, there's no survival here. Like there's no plan. I don't know how you're gonna do this. And then they do, or they don't. <laughs> so there is that. Um, so really, really enjoyed Mexican Gothic. Um, I wanna say, I don't know why I'm not seeing it. I, I did. I gave it five out of five stars. That's not um, usual for me. I've had a great reading year. I've had several four out of fives and five out of fives. And this is definitely one of them. For the right person, this is a great book. 
I know it's summertime, so we're talking beach reads here and there. Um, it seems dark if you are the traditional beach reader where you want a love story, drama, family drama, realistic fiction kind of story, not for you. But if you're like, like I said, you're looking for that, um, just sucks you in, you are challenged, you are trying to figure out what is going on, it is spooky, it is creepy, it is gross, this is it. Sylvia Marina Garcia has a number of other books, The Beautiful Ones, Certain Dark Things, Signal to Noise, Gods of Jade and Shadow, Untamed Shore. So she has a number of other books. I've not heard of her before. This is the first one that I've heard of. I definitely put her on my to-be-read list. She's, I'm adding her to my authors that I want to read more from. And like I said, I do have a net galley copy of the Velvet something. The Vel mm, let me look at that. Velvet was the night. That's my net galley book that I have from her. So I do plan on um, reading that one. And here's the cover to that, if you can zoom in on that. Um, again, I don't know who's doing her covers, but they deserve a lot of money. They do fabulous covers. They make me want to read it. So I would label this under the genre of gothic, suspense, horror. It definitely has some horror in there. When I'm talking to my kids about that difference in like thriller or horror, um, I think it's like the gross factor maybe that pushes it over to horror for me. It's like the difference in Dean Koontz and Stephen King to me. Dean Koontz, very suspenseful, um, weird stuff going on, supernatural, but Stephen King sometimes takes it to that next level of just disgusting. Um, so I think that's the difference and there's some disgusting scenes in here, but they're very memorable and they are necessary. I remember when I was looking up information on this author, it did say that she wrote a lot of speculative fiction. I think they called it even speculative crime fiction. So that's interesting. And like I said on the flap there, when they said, you know, she's not used to be an amateur sleuth, she is a bit of a sleuth. The main character is a bit of a sleuth in here because something has happened to her cousin. Something's happening to her cousin. She is sent to clean it up kind of by her dad. Um, and she has to figure out what's happening because it's not like she gets there, sees the situation and says, aha, I know what's happening and here's how we fix it. It doesn't work that way. It's weird. There's something weird going on. It's terrifying. It's entertaining. It's creepy. It's spooky. It would be a great read for the fall, Halloween. I can totally see myself sitting out on the back porch reading this one. That would be so nice in the evenings. It takes place in 1950s Mexico. I remember when I was reading it and I was talking to somebody telling them that I was reading it and they said, well, I just don't like period pieces. Neither do I. I don't know. I'm, I'm not a big historical fiction fan. Like I read it and I enjoy it, but it's not my go-to. Um, I'm not big historical fiction or period pieces. And yes, it is definitely 1950s Mexico. So, but it only adds to the story. It's not, that is not the, the whole thing. Like that's not it. It takes place in the countryside. There's a whole, well, there, I said, oh, I really liked in the last video whenever I put the book up there so that you could see it while I was talking about it, and I forgot about that, so let's try that again if I can get it to stand. <laughs> um, there's a whole cast of characters in this book. That's another thing that I really appreciated. Each of them really stand as a character. They develop along the way. She has to figure out how each of these people um, factor into the story. Um, they're very secluded. She has, they have her cousin secluded. After she got married, she goes to High Place. And then the conversation between them, the communication between um, her and their, and between the cousin and Nomi's family has been cut. Um, so she's very secluded. Uh, and that all plays into what is going on. We cannot figure out what's happened to you. It is that book that things are just not as they seem. And I like those kinds of books where I'm trying to figure it out alongside the character. I highly recommend this highly creepy novel by Sylvia Moreno Garcia. It will haunt you, it will entertain you, it has a great backstory that leads up to a phenomenal ending. But it's not for the faint of heart or the easily grossed out. So I give it a five out of five. I know I've shared with you my book goal for the year. I just heard a really, or I just watched a really good YouTube um, video by one of my favorite booktubers where she was talking about not focusing on the number, which I totally understand. Um, it, it doesn't make any sense to just set that number and then be like, oh, I'm not quite caught up. I'm gonna go find a really little short book to add to my number. I didn't do that with this. This was sitting there and I just really wanted to read it. But um, she talked about, you know, not focusing on that number. And I totally understand that. But I also know that if I don't set goals, I'm a goal-oriented person. If I don't set goals, then I won't push myself, right? So 
I set that number out there that I was going to read 100 books this year. I normally am more like a 60 to 70 books a year person. Um, I transition from being a librarian to being a back in the room um, teacher in high school. That definitely has adjusted my time. But what I know is we all have the same amount of time. <laughs> what we put into that time is our choice. And if I don't have those very clear goals set for me, then I will doom scroll <laughs> or, um, you know, just scroll through social media or watch TV or binge watch TV. Um, not that there isn't a time and a place for that, but I'm really not good at balance. I'm just not. So if I don't have a goal that says, hey, like this next book I'm talking to you about is the 42nd book that I've read this year, we are at the end of July. I should be at at least 50, what? I mean, 52, 54, I don't know, I'm terrible at math, but <laughs> I know that I should be farther along than I am. Um, it's a goal to shoot for. If I don't hit that goal, it's not like I'm gonna lose my job. I don't, it has nothing to do with that. But it's a personal goal that I'm shooting for, I'm striving for. So there's that. So this is the 42nd book. I am trying to do 100 this year. Um, I do know that, again, if I am looking at that and I look back, I can see where maybe I have doom scrolled too much or scrolled through social media or binge watched the entire first season of Skinwalker Ranch when I probably could have done that and spread it out a little bit more and read a little more. Um, so whatever, we'll get there. I just want to throw that out. But um, the next book I'm talking to you about is Lord Teach Me to Study the Bible in 28 Days. It is by Kay Arthur. I've had this book for a very long time. I started it a number of years ago and then I just kept setting it down. So um, I'm trying to finish all my borrowed books and finish all my books that I have started in the past and then laid down or get rid of them if I'm not going to finish them. And this is one that I did. I hmm, This is a hard one for me. I don't like the introduction at all. <laughs> um, I don't know how to exactly describe. I don't like the story that she used for an example. I don't see how it relates to the book. Um, but the book is good. It is a little more probably beginner Bible study than what I need. Um, I, I think I've talked a little bit about that in the past too. I grew up in the church. I don't remember a time when I didn't go to church. I was raised Southern Baptist and in a Southern Baptist church where they taught the Bible, period. Like it wasn't just we share happy messages and send you out in the world hoping that you feel good about yourself. Like you were expected to know the book. Um, you're expected to live by the book. You should be able to recite the book. Like, um, we study the Bible. So I feel like this is a little bit more for a beginner or maybe somebody who, um, has come to Christ later in their life, like, and maybe just has never sat down to study the Bible. Um, whereas I have been doing that my entire life. Um, having said that though, there is some really good stuff in here. She, this is more of a, I mean, this isn't just like read a chapter um, in the morning for your devotion, right? She is teaching you how to open your Bible, look at this chapter, here's how to devour this chapter. Mark it up, underline it, highlight it. What does this word mean? Define it, look it up, make notes. Like that's her premise for this book. It's like how to read your Bible. So I did really get some good stuff out of this. Um, I just think she's probably... A little more conservative than I am, which is perfectly fine. I'm a very open and loving person. <laughs> I am friends with all kinds. However, her story in the introduction, I just don't, I don't know why you needed to include that. I don't think it has anything to do with me learning to study the Bible. Why? Just why? <laughs> but you know what? You're the author. You wrote the book. You can write whatever you want to. <laughs> and again, even if we think differently, I will read your book and I will learn from it. It did take me way more than 28 days to read this, um, but if you picked it up, you could definitely do it in a month. It's very doable. I would say when I took it out to the porch with my Bible, I could do this in about five to 10 minutes for each of the days, which is perfectly fine in the summer for me. I spend at least that much time out on the porch reading. She has some things with the Old Testament and some things from the New Testament, so I really like that. My only real problem, hmm, my only real struggle, I guess, is what she chose to open the book with and then what she chose to end the book with. So her story in the introduction and then ending on Sodom and Gomorrah. I just, I feel like there are other <laughs> stories that probably would have been better examples for someone who you were introducing to how to read the Bible. But I've done many, many Bible studies over my, you know, 50 years 
Um, some that are easier, a little more light, and some that are really intensive and take hours to do. So I, I've done both ends of the spectrum, and this I would, I would definitely recommend for someone who has never sat down with a highlighter or notes when they're reading the Bible. She definitely walks you through how to do that, and I do really appreciate this book. I gave it a three out of five. For someone who hasn't done a lot of note taking, either you know with your Bible or just with any kind of a book, a nonfiction book, or when you're in you know high school or college or whatever, she does a good job of describing to you. Here's how you take notes. Here's why you take notes, and this is how it's going to help you. So for that, I think it's a great book. The next book that I read is this Fourth of July Raid. It's by Wilma Pitchfork. No, ha. It's by Wilma Pitchford Hayes, illustrated by Peter Burchard. Um, and on the back here, it says Weekly Reader Children's Book Club. I have this whole set, actually two different sets, I think, of these books that like are like this, where they were re Weekly Readers or Children's Set. I know I had one when I was growing up. I don't know that that's the one that I ended up with um, or if I picked this up somewhere along the way or if I had it whenever my kid was young. Again, my kid's 22, so um, I, it's by this time, I don't know where all these books came from, but I always look at these and think, I know I don't know enough of our history. So when 4th of July came around, I saw that this book was there, I picked it up and just went out on the back porch and read it. So very quick, um, and it was really good. <laughs> I guess I didn't expect it to be quite that good, but it is really good. Um, this particular author has also written a couple of other books in the series, Christmas on the Mayflower, Pilgrim Thanksgiving, The Story of Valentine and Freedom. I did see that I have some more of those. So on the other holidays, I hope to go and remember to pick those up and read them. Um, but she fictionalizes a story with Tom Morris and his cousin, Elizabeth, and um, it is illustrated, but she fictionalizes a story of what happened on July 4th in 1779 when Connecticut, his hometown, was being invaded by the British. So it tells that story of that invasion, how Tom reacts, what Elizabeth has already been through back in 1776. Um, and you just get this nice little narrative story about what that would have looked like on that night through the eyes of children. I did see that this particular um, edition is available on Amazon, so you can still purchase those. I would highly recommend these for that intermediate, you know, even a child if you want to read it with them, um, but especially that intermediate reader could totally go through here. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to be stereotypical, but I know a lot of times our male readers, our male children, uh, like nonfiction better than fiction, and we have a tendency to try and push them to Harry Potter or um, other kinds of fictional books that we enjoy when they are more apt to read a nonfiction book. So the book opens up with Tom and his cousin sitting around the kitchen table and they are discussing um, the British warships being in the Long Island Sound when they hear the cannon start. So then Tom must take action to try and save his family and his home. Um, and that's the story that you get. So, and then you also, it follows you through that night and um, him the next morning. It's super good. I really enjoyed it. And I know that I'm talking about a little weekly reader book, but it was really good. I really enjoyed it. So I gave this a four out of five because it is well written and I do highly recommend it. And now we come to the Kate Carlisle section of our video. So the latest Kate Carlisle Bibliophile Mystery is called The Little Black Book. I really hope that you can see that um, cover because I love her covers. They're very cozy covers. You know, in this one we have a castle because it's Scottish based. Uh, we have a cat, we have a tartan. I mean, come on, this is just lovely. There's a set of golf clubs um, and a dagger. I am one of Kate's raters, so she does send me the books for free in um, exchange for an honest review. Actually, I think it's three honest reviews. Um, and then just last week, I got this in the mail. So I was going to show it to you before I put it in here. But she sent us a signed book plate, which is awesome. I'm excited to put that in there. And a little thank you. So that's, that is awesome. I love that. Um, remember, I have talked to you about this bibliophile mystery, and I don't even know how many other videos, probably almost every video that I have has a Kate Carlisle review in it. But this is her latest in the bibliophile mystery series. It's number 15. You can see my Kate Carlisles are up on the very top on the right. So I can see up there. I don't know. I didn't, I've got something going on. I got to get a ladder and get up there because something, something wonky's going on up there. 
So right before I knew that this book was coming out, I did go back and clean up some of my Kate Carlisle reviews, making sure I had a review out there for every Bibliophile Mystery series, one through 14, and then also that Fixer Up um, series. So I did put all of those out there, and I know I've told you before, I do plan on, at some point, pulling all of those Kate Carlisles down and just doing a Kate Carlisle video. That was on my summer list of things to do. Um, I think I have about four weeks before school starts, so hopefully I'll get it in before then. But when I was doing that, I was looking up some information on Kate Carlisle, and I did see that she's a Daphne du Maurier Award recipient, and I have talked to you about Daphne du Maurier, um, Rebecca, uh, and several others, and I know I've got some down here that I'm going to talk about um, today <clears throat> in the other portion of the video, but how appropriate because this book is centered on a copy of Rebecca. Remember in the Bibliophile Mystery Series, it centers around Brooklyn. Brooklyn is a book restorer, um, and she often gets caught up while she's restoring these books in some sort of a book mystery, and not in the reading the book mystery sense, but then and somehow when she is restoring one of these books, someone around the story is murdered, and she is in the middle of it. So that is where we are again with Little Black Book. This is one of those books where I'm just going to give you some vocabulary and you're going to know that you want to read this book, right? Things like lard, the laird, laird, things like laird, castle, decode. That's a fun one. Um, this is one of those books where it's cozy, right? So to me, the definition of a cozy mystery is a mystery that has a cover like this, <laughs> is about that long. Um, there is a mystery that happens within a community. Here it's the bookbinders community. Um, her husband is a private security person. His community is there. Brooklyn's family. Um, it happens in San Francisco. They also go out to wine country to where her parents live in a commune and they often go back and forth. So to me, a cozy takes place in a small community. There is some sort of a murder, but it is not gruesome. Or, you know, I'm not saying that murder is not gruesome. Like you might walk in and the murder victim has a dagger in their chest. Uh, that's gruesome, obviously. But they don't go into detail about the blood and the gore, or it's not especially violent. Like somebody might be attacked, but it's usually like um, they got knocked over during the attack or they got knocked out and then something happened. There's not a um, heavy violence going on in these books. I think that's what makes it kind of a cozy. And um, when like when you're reading Mexican Gothic, you can see like that's not cozy. That's horrific. <laughs> this is cozy. So this is a fun one. Brooklyn and Derek have a mutual acquaintance. Someone comes looking for Derek and it ends up that Brooklyn also knows this person. Her aunt has gone missing. Derek knows the aunt from his line of work um, and Brooklyn knows the girl from her line of work. This adventure takes them to Dharma um, and also to Scotland. They're trying to solve a missing persons case um, that is centered around this book arriving on their doorstep on a quaint Saturday morning. I always appreciate Brooklyn's talks on book restore and I think it's fascinating. You know, if you're a booktube or if you're a YouTube fan, just go on to YouTube and put in there like book restoration. You can watch the process like from start to finish and it's fascinating. There was a segment on our um, spectrum. When you turn on our um, spectrum, it goes straight to channel one. So I don't know how it works on everybody else's. It feels like everybody's is different, but they do little short news segments and I did that one day and they were talking to um, a company down in Cincinnati. It uh, sounded like it was two brothers. I came in like in the middle of it, but it sounded like it was two brothers that do book restorations. And he said by far they do family Bibles. Um, that's their most popular, but it, it will be any kind of a book usually that's been in a family that just needs a little extra love. That's what they do the most of. And they were able to kind of catch up during the pandemic and then now they are, you know, back, back, whatever. They've got a lot to do, <laughs> um, but it was fascinating to hear him talk about it and then to watch the video of the parts of them putting it in the vise and re-sewing the bindings and putting new covers on it. It was just fascinating. In addition to the book binding, this particular one talks about antique weaponry. Um, where we have Brooklyn and Derek Stone, the next main character in this particular book is Claire Quinn. Um, we had met Claire Quinn in a book previous. She was just kind of like an extra character, um, but in this one we get to know her, and my guess is we have not seen the last of Claire Quinn. We met Claire back in book eight, actually. I forgot that I had looked that up. Book eight is the book stops here. I'm also hoping because in the dedication, 
Uh, Kate Carlisle talks a little bit about Scotland. Sounds like she might have a future trip planned there. So I am looking forward to seeing if we might not have another book that's set in Scotland. It totally plays into the whole cozy mystery theme. Um, last summer, I listened to a couple of audio cozies. One of them is called The Loch Ness um, Papers, and I can't remember what the other one was called, but it was a Scottish um, series and it was really fun and I haven't listened to it. I listened to two last summer and then I haven't gone back to that series. I need to do that because I really liked that setting. I always enjoy checking in with Brooke, Brooklyn, her family, and her friends in the community. And several relationships kind of move ahead in this story. So not only do you revisit them, but it's like their lives their lives carry on and we get to see that. That's That's one of those things I really like in a cozy mystery series. Another feature of some of the newer cozy, I mean, maybe not even newer. So I don't know. I feel like a lot that I picked up lately include some recipes that are mentioned within the book in the back of the book. And this has one for a lobster bisque that I'm definitely going to have to try. So I gave this a four out of five, which I do most of Kate Carlisle's books um, because I really enjoy the series. I like reading the books in physical um in the physical format. I like reading them on my e-reader when I had to catch up with some that I had missed along the way. And I like listening to the audio. So in any format, I really like the Kate Carlisle cozy mystery books. The next book that I finished since the last time we talked is called Love Does by Bob Goff. This is another one that I've had for a number of years. I'd say I've had it for five years. I started reading it and then put it, put it down and then just took me a while to pick it back up. But again, really enjoyed it. I would call this, um, it's definitely Christian literature, religious literature, but more on the inspirational side. Um, I wouldn't say that this is a devotional book. It's more of just a, um, it's kind of memoirish, but he doesn't really tell his life story. He just tells little life lessons. So it's a good one to pick up and read like a, like a chapter a day. Um, and you can easily get through it. That's, again, one of those where I'm like, I just need to finish it. I enjoy it. Um, but it, it's not one that I feel like I've got to, like, plow through. So it just took me longer than it should have. The subtitle is Discovery Secretly Incredible Life in an Ordinary World. Um, Bob Goff, I think that people were introduced to him through another book. Did I make a note on that? Yeah, uh, Don Miller's A Million Miles in a Thousand Years. Um, which must be another religious book that I have not read, but he talked, I think, about Bob Goff and people were interested in hearing more from him, so he sat down and wrote his book. This is another one that I enjoyed. I want to say I gave it a three out of five. Do I have it? I didn't, mm, I didn't rate this one. I would say I probably would do about a three out of five on this because I did enjoy it. Um, he's a little, a little odd for me. You can tell that he's very wealthy, so some of the stories that he tells, I'm you know, rolling my eyes a little bit because that's not normal. Um, well, it's not normal for people like me who don't have this huge disposable income to play practical jokes on people. Um, but I really did enjoy it. There's some really good nuggets of truth in here. So basically his chapters are stories about something in his life and then he gives you a, a, like a universal truth to go along with it. Um, and that universal truth is a religious truth. He goes from his college days through his adulthood when he has a family, he has young kids. Um, so you get different areas of his life and something that happened and the truth that he took out of it. Uh, in the description on the back, it says that he's the founder of Restore International, a nonprofit fighting injustices committed against children in Uganda and India. He is also a lawyer, so that comes out quite a bit. He does talk about that. Um, he's a professor at Pepperdine Law University, I'm sorry, law school, um, and he refers to his wife as Sweet Maria, <laughs> um, and he does talk about his children. There were some lines that I really um, enjoyed in the book. Uh, it was the kind of place that you wanted to linger. I did underline that. I thought that one was good. Or God delights in answering our impossible prayers. That's a really good universal truth. I, you know, several times I caught myself writing things down um, recopying down the line because it was just, it, it resounded with me. But there are some times when he's just a little silly, like just, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of like when um, I used to go to churches where the pastor would always open with some sort of a story. And sometimes it would be humorous or sometimes it would lead into what his message was about. It struck me as kind of like that pastor's opening story. Uh, it was copyright 2012, so it is a little bit dated, 
but it's an interesting way to not only tell his story, but to talk about some universal truths. So I enjoyed it. I would give it about a three out of five. The next book that I read was The Pioneers by David McCullough. So you can see the books that I have here are kind of weird this month. I didn't really notice it until I sat down to talk to you about it. Um, but I loved Mexican Gothic. I love Kate Carlisle's Cozy. Um, I had that devotional book to throw in there that was good. And it took me the whole month to, you know, just do one a day because I was just going through it. I kind of did the same thing with Love Does. And then we had our book club doing the Pioneers. So I had the books on CD that one of our book members had loaned me. So I was listening to it that way in my car. Um, I had it on audio so that I would listen to it when I was cleaning the house. But definitely with this one, at the end of the day, I would have to sit down with the print version and go back over what I had listened to because it's heavy. So I don't know about you, but that's how I kind of am with audios. Like I can do cozies with audio or light books. Um, like I said, I just finished Daisy Jones and the Six, which is a must in audio because it's more of a performance. But a heavy book like this, I can listen to the audio, but I'm going to need to see it and make some notes on it, especially if I'm expected to discuss it with book club. <laughs> um, but this is really good. This is totally out of my wheelhouse. It's not a cozy mystery. It's not a thriller. It's not a mystery. Um, it is phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Um, I'm really glad that we chose it for our book club. Our book club then decided to go up to um, Carolyn Park in Dayton and take a tour uh, and that has a lot to do with the Wright brothers. So it kind of all just came together with Ohio history. Um, so the pioneers focuses on the Northwest Territory, the founding of the Northwest Territory. Now, I am not a history person. I enjoy it. I know that I should know it. I don't. Um, but I really appreciated this book. So this, uh, David McCullough, I would think you probably do recognize his name. He's written a lot of books. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning historian. Um, and in this particular one, it's American's history, the settling of the Northwest Territory and the pioneers who were integral in that. I learned about the treaty, I learned more about the Treaty of Paris um, and Great Britain and the pioneers coming over here and then how we spread out through the Americas. The, the way that this book was set up, I also thought was super interesting because it follows a number of people. So it's not just talking about the history of the Northwest Territory and, you know, just throwing everything out there. It really focuses in on, was it three or five, on about five different people. Let me see, I'm pretty sure it gives me the full names because I just have them down by their last name. There's a Massachusetts minister, Manasseh Cutler. There's a Revolutionary War general. Um, he's a veteran of the Revolutionary War, General Rufus Putman, Cutler's son, Ephraim, and then two other men, Joseph Barker, a carpenter turned architect, and Samuel Hildreth, a physician who became a prominent figure in American science. You can see why I needed to take notes. Now, in all honesty, once we read the book and we went to the book club and we did the tour, um, I think it was like three hours and then we like cut it short because we had some people with us that, um, you know, were getting very hot, very tired. Um, so we cut our, the, our portion of the tour a little bit short and then we did not stay and discuss the book. We're going to discuss it at the next book club because it's just a little, it was a little bit much for the whole day. I do highly recommend that Carolyn Park tour. I plan to take my dad on that tour next summer. Um, because I think he would really be fascinated by all the history. Our uh, docent, our um, tour guide, she was fabulous. I mean, she just was a fount of information. And it's kind of a, it's a walking tour. Like we had a wheelchair for one of our members. We had a golf cart that would take them from building to building. But then once you got to the building, you went inside and there were displays in each of the building. Super phenomenal tour. Um, I will link that in the show notes also. But this book just covers so much information um, and a funny story. So one of our former uh, principals met us for lunch one day and uh, we were just chit chatting about what was going on. And I don't know how I mentioned it, but I said, hey, you know, we were reading this book and uh, it was this fast. Oh, that's what it was. We were talking about education and reform, um, which obviously if you get two educators in a room, they're going to talk to you about education <laughs> reform. Um, and I said, I had no idea that how the Northwest Territory, when it was being formed, how they were based on three things, that there would be no slavery, that there would be free education, um, 
what's the third thing? And there would be freedom of religion. You'd think I'd remember that. But they, it was based on those three things. And I didn't realize how important that free education part was to developing the Northwest Territory. So I was talking to him a little bit about the book. And um, one of our other book club members was there. And he said, Stephanie, did you not take American history in high school? And she was like, yeah. And he's like, how do you not already know this? And I thought, <laughs> you could be saying to Shannon as well as Stephanie here, we weren't paying attention apparently. Like, I know I've heard these things before. I've heard of the Treaty of Paris. I've heard of the Northwest Territory. But when you're talking to someone like me who does not have a great grasp on history, when you start mentioning the names of the people like that are at the same time, um, and I'm starting to put those people together and you have, you know, George Washington and Cutler and um, all of these like people. And then it goes on down the list and they start talking about like how the Wright brothers had all this stuff. Like it goes through talking about everything that has to fall in place for us to be who we are today as Ohio. And I think I just don't put all that together. I don't know how everybody fits together. So this book helped me put all those pieces together. Will I remember it? Maybe not all those details, but it's good to hear it one more time of how hard those pioneers struggled to um, give us what we have today. Now, a mm, little thing I did want to make sure I mentioned when I did this, because, you know, most of the time, like, I just flat out read a book or listen to a book and then look up information either as I'm going along or afterward. Um, and one of the big gripes online about this book is how much... It just doesn't talk that much about the Native Americans. He does talk about the Native Americans. He does address it. He does not focus on it. We all know they were here before we were. And when we spread out, it was not pretty. Both sides were vicious. So he mentions some of the attacks that the Native Americans had on the pioneers. He talks about how the pioneers um, reacted to that. So it is addressed, but it's definitely a back story that does not take up a lot of space in the book because his book is focusing on forming the Northwest Territory, how that happened, how hard it was, the challenges that they faced, where it fits into history. I think that's his focus. So he did not go off on that tangent and start making, you know, judgmental stories about how, what our history looked like, what we did wrong, and how we need to make those retributions. That wasn't this book. There are definitely books that address that, <clears throat> and it should be addressed, but that's not this book. Um, but I don't think that he ignored it. He definitely addresses. There's some information, again, like hearing the names of the people, the Native Americans um, that were alongside these pioneers making the Northwest Territory, it helps me place everything where it goes. So, super good. Our book club also read the book by um, McCullough, the Wright Brothers, and we talked about it back in 2017. It was another super good read. He's also written one on John Adams, um, 1776, that I would like to read. Maybe a little more in depth than my 4th of July going <laughs> down here. So this is definitely a five out of five for me too. It's not my usual book. It is not a page turner, but it is really good, and I highly recommend it. Um, you know, the audio was really good. If you don't have to discuss it and you just want to kind of hear the story and take it in, the audio is a good way to go. Um, it's just with it being a book club, I always lead that discussion and I feel like I got to be a little more prepared. Um, so this one I had to do some notes to make sure that I get everything straight. My people, my times, how they all fit together. Um, and then just little snippets that I really wanted to mention that I uh, like here. I've got how interesting that the letters of introduction um, so when somebody of importance was traveling in another town, like Cutler went to Boston, and when he went to Boston, people that he knew wrote letters of introduction to people that were in Boston that they knew and said, hey, my friend Manassas Cut Cut Cutler is coming to your town. Could you host him? Can he stay with you? Will you show him or will you talk to him about what you know? And those letters of introduction just opened doors for him. And I thought, how interesting. We do still kind of do that now, but um, you know, back then, if someone didn't know someone else, you wouldn't know who to talk to. Like it just, it's just interesting to me how that works. So Cutler then was able to um, like tour a museum, the prison museum. Um, 
He went on hospital rounds with one of the doctors. He met with Benjamin Franklin. And all of this was because he knew people back where he was from who wrote introductions to people uh, in Boston and said, hey, can you take my friend around? I thought that was really cool. So I highly recommend The Pioneers by David McCullough. Um, I have read The Wright Brothers and I've read this one, so I do plan on reading another one of his books or listening to it. It was super fascinating. The next book that I finished is The Spring of Devotions, sorry, Springs of Devotion, uh, inspiring writings about the meaning and joy of prayer. It says, with a little treasury of great prayers, it is put out by Hallmark. It's super small. I mean, I know you're like, hey lady, really 42, you're going to count those? Yes, I am, because I don't have those. It's got to be a 400-page book or whatever. Um, the number is just something for me to shoot for. Uh, but this is another one that was on my shelf for a long time. And um, when I picked it up, I'm like, why am I not just reading one of these a day during my devotional time? It will help me focus. And that is exactly what it did. I think that it was perfect for that. Um, these poems are, <clears throat> these prayers are selected by Arthur Wartman. And there are some illustrations by William Gilmore. And by illustrations, they look, they just look like this. So it's probably the calligraphy that they're referring to. Um, and they are beautiful little, um, you know, renditions of the prayers. And like I said, I would just read, I think I read, you know, five or 10 pages every time I sat down for my devo devotional reading in the morning. And um, some were more inspiring than others. But they are definitely by people that you've heard some of these names, not all of them. And there are some um, prayers that were pulled out of the Bible, like um, the Lord's Prayer is in here. And St. Augustine has a prayer in here. And Mary Elizabeth Coleridge, um, <clears throat> St. Thomas More, Thomas Merton, Jane Austen, Thomas Fuller. So there are some names that you know. It is broken up into three sections, the gift of prayer, the practice of prayer, a little treasury of great prayers. It's just a super, a super good one. I'm not sure that you could find this somewhere. I didn't look to see if you could find this one on Amazon, but you know, miss, take it with a grain of salt that I'm sure there are a ton of these little books that have little prayers in them. And it was just something to help me center whenever I sat down to read. I gave it a three out of five. And that's it since the last time that I've talked to you. So <clears throat> it's really not as big of a stack as usual because usually I have like a stack like this plus the ones that I've done on ebook and audio. But um, like I said, just before I started this video, I did finish Daisy Jones and the Six on audio. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that one, but I really will push that one till the next video because I haven't done my background work on it. But I'm telling you now, order it uh, from your library, the audio. It is a production. It's super good. It was a Reese book club book. Um, she said that she listened to it in a day. It did take me the whole month to listen to it. Um, I want to say it's like 10 hours long. Um, and I just didn't have as much time this past month to listen to books like I normally do. I was around more people. Um, so I don't do as many audios when that happens. But highly, highly recommend it. It's super good. It's by Taylor Jenkins, Jenkins Reid. So I'm a little bit behind for my monthly goal. I am up to... 46. Um, so I'm hoping that next week I will get a little more reading done because I will be on vacation, lounging at the beach, and uh, just relaxing. So that's my game plan. It seems that this video has turned into like a snowball. So like I talked about the books that I've read and then I mentioned all these different books while I'm doing that. I talked about the books that I recently reviewed and then I mentioned some books in there and then all of a sudden I'm like, wait a minute. I know I've talked about that book, but it's not listed in any of my notes anywhere. So I need to go back and make sure that I've reviewed that book and talk to you a little bit more about it. So that's the big uh, chunk here that I'm gonna do next. I am well aware that I repeat myself. I talk about books multiple times. I repeat myself, I repeat myself, I repeat reviews, but I make connections between the books and then I just like to fill in the blanks because I am a fairly organized person. I am a librarian by trade. I like things to be in order. <laughs> so just throwing that out there. All right, so here's the stack that I have posted that said you need to revisit these. So we'll see if I can remember why I needed to revisit these. It looks like in this stack we have She Said Yes by Misty Bernal, Will Grayson, Will Grayson by John Green and David Levithan, The Woman in the Window by AJ Finn. Did you just see that? We've been cleaning in here. <laughs> we hung up, um, I don't know if you can see it, I'll have to insert a picture. I, uh, or my husband, hung some pictures in here, so it looks like I had a little dust there. Um, Agatha Christie's A Mysterious Affair at Styles. 
and Agatha Christie's The Murder of Roger Ackroyd. So let me look at my notes, consult my notes, and see why I thought I needed to revisit these. Aha! First one is that Agatha Christie, these ones that I've talked to you about, the uh, murder of Roger Ackroyd and the mysterious affair is Styles. The main character is Hercule Poirot. Um, and in the last video, I just know I stumbled over pronunciation. So I apologize. There are a couple things that when I went back, I'm like, I don't think I pronounced that right. I apologize. I am a reader. I read it on the page. And then sometimes when I hear it, um, I'm like, mm, I'm pretty sure I screwed that up. Um, and I've been watching a lot of Agatha Christie here lately and Hercule Poirot, his name is out there. And I'm pretty sure that's not how I said it. I think I say Hercule. Um, and I don't even know how I said Poirot. So making a correction on that. I did go back and watch her. I like, I think I played it while I was cleaning, but the murder of Roger Ackroyd, I had seen before. I have it down that it's on Acorn. Um, and all of these um, Agatha Christie ones that are done on TV, I'm saying all, but I'm all. Like they are worth it. I love watching those. Um, and then the Mysterious Affair at Styles is on BritBox. So I just wanna make sure, cause I feel like I might have told you, I might have swapped those. Um, so I'm correcting those in the notes here. The Mysterious Affair is Styles, which this was it, but I know it's not a great cover, but um, I had read and talked to you about that one, and I just wanted to let you know that it is also on BritBox. Uh, BritBox has Agatha Christie's Hercule Poirot on um, uh, season three. <clears throat> and I just watched another one yesterday, and I will have to um, look it up for you. It was something like Murder by Champagne. It was so good. It was so different. It was not a, Her a Hercule Pol Perot. Uh, there was an older couple that looks like they were retired and they got called back in on a case and it was, it was just really good. Um, when I was talking to you about The Woman in the Window by A.J. Finn, um, I know I kept stumbling over agoraphobia. I think I called it agoraphobia. So just making that correction, it's agoraphobia and I apologize. I'm not sure how I pronounced um, David Levithan's last name. So that's another one that I talked to you about Will Grace and Will Grace and I believe in the last video. And I probably stumbled over his name. And when I looked it up, the way that I understand it is David Levithan. So I apologize. And then the last one that was pronunciation error was um, she said, yes, the unlikely martyrdom of Cassie Bernal. And I think I might have just kept saying Casey, 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 and I watched a video and it's Cassie. So I apologize. Corrections on my pronunciations, not my strong point. And I want to make sure I get it right. Um, the other one that I looked back and I thought, mm, I might need to correct that. I keep mentioning Louise Penny's um, book that was turned into a TV movie and it's called Still Life. It is on Acorn. I did check and I'm like, is it on Acorn or BritBox? And I do that every stinking time I talk to you about it. It is on Acorn and well worth a watch. I love Louise Penny. Um, a little bit of book information, uh, book news out there for Louise Penny. Her next one is going to be released in August. Um, and I really wanted to read another one of hers before she got a new one out. Um, I need to um, reserve that from the library because I really enjoy her books. They're great mystery thrillers i'm going to put them in that genre i'm not sure if that's quite right um but the other thing that i saw that i'm super excited about is that she and hillary clinton have done a book together i want to know what that looks like i really want to know what that looks like so going to get on the list for that too and then we'll see so throwing those two out there big book news in the louise penny world all right so the next section these the post it said um, are ones that I needed to recommend. I had mentioned them to you, but I didn't give it a full review. So I'm going to do that now because these need a little more attention. We have the seven habits of highly effective people by Stephen Covey, um, long way down by Jason Reynolds for everyone by Jason Reynolds, Daphne du Maurier's the flight of the Falcon. I don't have a review on that. It's on my to be read list, the scapegoat. I don't have, um, a review on that it's on my to be read list also mary mary ann hmm, beautiful beautiful book but on my to be read list um and i think i was putting those out there because i had talked to you about some of the daphne du Maurier, um books rebecca and jamaica or but 
I think I talked to you about Rebecca, but I didn't talk to you about Jamaica Inn. Um, and the next one, I just wanted, I can't not, I can't separate a series. <laughs> so the next one is my cousin Rachel and that's on my to be read list. So um, just throwing some of these out there and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about these. Let me back up just a little bit. I'm not sure if I had mentioned on Agatha Christie's The Murder of Roger Ackroyd that that is the fourth Perot novel out of about 45 Perot novels. That's impressive and I plan to read every last one of them. They never disappoint. That English village setting where he operates out of is just cozy. In that particular novel, you can tell that he's trying to settle into not being in the midst of things, but he, you know, he's trying out retirement, it's not going great. <laughs> um, so I just really enjoyed that one. And he talks about his little gray cells. So I just, I forgot, I just want to mention that part. I know I talked to you a little bit about The Mysterious Affair at Styles, and this to me is just one of her best ones. We read it with our Classics Book Club back when we had a Classics Book Club, um, but it was a great introduction into Agatha Christie. You just, you're not gonna know what happens till the very end. All right, so I had reviewed Jamaica Inn um, back on Goodreads back in 2016, but I really haven't talked to you a whole lot about it here. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. It, to me, is a very gothic suspense kind of novel. I like Daphne du Maurier. I love Rebecca. I'm probably not as fond of Jamaica Inn as I was of Rebecca. I don't know, it's a little darker, a little slower for me. I would say Rebecca is a gothic romance, whereas maybe Jamaica Inn is more of a mystery. The psychological thriller part of the book is what kept me reading it. Um, they also have put a series out there hmm, on Acorn um, that I need to watch. I have not watched it. I looked it up and it wasn't available at the time that I looked it up, but I think it might be out there now. So that's on my to be watched list. And then, like I said, my cousin Rachel, Marianne, oh, look at that beautiful picture of Du Maurier, The Scapegoat, and The Flight of the Falcon are all on my um, short list. <laughs> my short list is so long. <laughs> um, two other books that I've mentioned but not given a great review out there for um, are both Jason Reynolds' Long Way Down and then For Everyone. I'm pretty sure I talked to you pretty extensively about A Long Way Down, sorry, Long Way Down by Jason Reynolds in one of my previous videos, but um, I just, I didn't have a whole um, lot of my notes out there, so I just wanted to make sure that I highly recommend this book. And also For Everyone, I highly recommend this one. This one was in one of my book hauls. I picked it up at Ollie's um, up in Michigan back in May, but I had read it like last summer. So I was glad to pick up a copy for my home library and also for my school library, because this is a nice short one. Um, you know, Jason Reynolds, uh, they're short. I'm going to call it like freestyle writing, not really poetry, but not a novel, but super, super good. I really like this. Um, and I agree, it is for everyone. He has on the back, this is for the courageous and everyone who wants to be. Super good, I love it. Um, and then this uh, Long Way Down, um, I use this in class a lot this year, you can see, because it had so many great examples in there for me. When I was talking about um, figurative language, it's all over in this book. This is a super good one. It is also written in that free verse kind of um, writing, but it's all one story. So this particular book is a story from beginning to last of a boy whose brother has been gunned down and how he is thinking about making retribution for that, like getting revenge um, and what that would do to his own life and how that works in his culture. And he's walking us through that. He meets, hmm, no. He connects with three people, I believe, on the elevator as he is on his way to seek revenge. And each of those people have something to tell him. It's so good, it's so good. Please read this book. This is a Newbery Honor book. It's a Prince Honor book. It's a Coretta Scott King Honor book and a Walter Dean Myers Award for Excellence, the Gold Seal. So lots of awards on there and rightly so. There should be because this is a fabulous book. Now I've got these set up here and I found my paper for Rebecca and it looks like I didn't put the review out there for Rebecca until June. Eh, I'm not sure what's going on. So let me just make sure that I tell you, you need to read Rebecca. It's a gothic, romantic, psychological thriller. 
Um, you will be entertained. You will be frightened. <laughs> um, oh, that's what. It, that's the other thing that I wanted to mention. Um, and maybe I did in my last video, but Du Maurier, du Maurier also wrote for um, Stephen King. She wrote The Birds, that ridiculously great movie that you should watch. I think it was on Peacock, if I'm not mistaken. I think I did miss, mention this to you in the last video, and then I noticed that I needed to throw some of these other ones out there. But um, Rebecca is an unnamed, Rebecca has an unnamed narrator um, because she is known as the second Mrs. DeWinter. And when she marries Rich to this rich guy and he takes her back to uh, Manderley, I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, she finds out that that first wife has a stronger presence than she was expecting. I'm sure I talked to you about Rebecca, um, but God, that's such a good one. So let me get back to these. So for everyone, it's a fast read. It's inspirational poetry. Um, it's a current favorite uh, with my kids. J Jason Reynolds is a current favorite with my students right now, um, mainly because when we read this, then we were looking for other books that he had done. And this is just kind of like, um, a quick book that I think he put out there to encourage his readers to just not give up. And it might be a short book, but it's very powerful. Long Way Down is what I would call a novel in verse. It's realistic urban fiction. It tells a story. You are drawn in. You, it hurts. It hurts. Reynolds was the national ambassador for uh, young people's literature in 2020 and 2021. It's equally visual, so there are things sprinkled throughout that book. So the poems are also concrete poems, um, and then there are some other illustrations and visual things that go on in that book. So it does hit all the senses. I do remember that we used it when we were talking about our five senses in uh, freshman English last year. Highly recommend both of these by Jason Reynolds, and he's another author that's on my list of authors to read anything that they write. So another book that I mentioned but I didn't really review is Stephen Covey's um, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I think I mentioned it because I had picked up um, his son's um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens and kind of mentioned that. And then I mentioned this, but I didn't give a full review. So I did want to throw it out there. Um, I have it reviewed on Goodreads back in 2019. Um, I think he probably did the talk show circuit, and that's how we got to know Stephen Covey. And then I picked up the book. I listened to several versions of this book like i listened to this on audio there was one on parenting like the seven habits of highly effective parents um uh there i think there was one for teachers like it's in a couple of different forms but it all comes back to seven habits that we all need to really work on so those seven habits are be proactive begin with the end in mind put first things first think win-win Seek first to understand and then to be understood, synergize, and sharpen the saw. These are seven things that he goes in depth on. This is what people who are effective really look at these things, think about them, and then put them in their personal management. So yes, I know it's been out there a long time, but if this one got past you, go back and pick it up. It's another one that like you could read a chapter every couple of days. This was published in 1989. Um, but it's just a good self-help, psychological kind of, um, you need to work on this in your head kind of book. I need to read it again. Sorry, it's a little hot today. Like I think, God, what is it, 90? It says it's 88, but I have my air conditioner going. I also have the door open, but my gosh, it is hot today. So my hair is a little like, ah, that's okay. It is what it is. We're gonna drink some iced tea and it'll be okay. I wanted to give a little shout out to my friend Louisa who gave me this book nerd mug for Christmas. I don't know if you can tell, like here's my phone so you can kind of see size. I love this mug because it's so big. So yes, I drink my coffee out of it, but it's a great one that through the day I could just put something else into, but it's an adorable little mug. So thank you, Louisa. I hope you're watching. So the next couple of books that I wanted to talk to you about go right up here. This is where I have my newberries, the ones that I've read, the ones that I need to read. I think they're going this way. And then the book of the month, I have a couple of those that I really like and I've talked to you about some of those. So I noticed that I had left a couple out, so I just wanna catch up on some of those. So currently I have this book, it's, it's my school library, so I don't have a copy of this one, but I did read it and I wanted to talk to you about it. It's The Girl Who Drank the Moon by Kelly Barnhill. This was the winner of the Newberry Medal in 2017, and one of my students donated, donated this to the classroom. I had already read it, but since I have a copy of it at home, I wanted to talk to you about it today. 
I reviewed this book back in 2018 on Goodreads. It is a beautifully written book. I'm going to call it a tale. It feels more like a tale. Someone is telling you a story. Uh, it's in a fantasy world, and this is where children are basically sacrificed. Doesn't sound much like a new Barry Award winner, but it is. But in this world, children are sacrificed, and it's just something that that culture does, but the children are saved by, like, this witch kind of woman, um, and normally she feeds them by the stars, and this particular child um, ends up drinking the moon and it changes who she is. Gosh, that sounds odd. I don't know if I'm doing a very good job of describing this one, but it is definitely a tale of magic. Childhood um, It's beautiful. It is easy for me to recommend this book to junior high, high school fantasy readers. You're gonna love this book. I'm pretty sure that we read this with my book club too. Um, let me read a little bit here. Every year, the people of the Protectorate leave a baby as a sacrifice to the witch who lives in the forest. But the witch, Zan, is a kind one. She rescues the children and she delivers them to the welcoming families on the other side of the forest, nourishing the babies with starlight on the journey. But one year, Zan accidentally feeds a baby moonlight instead of starlight. And it fills the ordinary child with extraordinary magic. Zan decides she must raise this girl whom she calls Luna as her own. As Luna's 13th birthday approaches, her magic begins to emerge with dangerous and thrilling consequences. Um, uh, and it's got like um, uh, two little recommendations here. One is the Daily Mail and one is the Guardian, which makes me think, is this British? I think it is. Um, it's by Piccadilly Press in the UK. So yeah, there you go. Um, so speaking of all that, what comes up July 31st? Come on, Potterheads. It's Harry Potter's birthday. So that is coming up, what is that? This coming week, how exciting is that? Um, so normally right around that time, they play all the movies on loop and I'm not gonna be home to watch that. I have them all on DVD. I think I actually have them all on Blu-ray too. So uh, that'll be something that I will do when I come back. But especially this summer, I've really not been watching too much. I don't wanna be inside. My porch is lovely. I hope that you can hear the birds in the background, but it has just been lovely this summer and I just stay out there, so. I've not been inside watching too much, but I will definitely do the Harry Potter marathon because that's what we all must do to celebrate Harry Potter's birthday. <laughs> so I highly recommend The Girl Who Drank the Moon. It is the 2017 Newbery Award winner. The other Newbery that I have not um, talked to you about, but I have reviewed in the past, is Because of When Dixie by Kate DiCamillo. Now I know I've talked to you about Kate DiCamillo, but somehow I think this one has slipped through the cracks. I reviewed this book back in February, but I don't remember talking to you about it. Um, but the main character is Opal. She rescues this wild, stray, scraggly dog. There are a number of different um, covers, and I really do like this one. The other one has Opal on it um, with Win Dixie, but I just love this cover. It is a Newbery Honor book, um, so not a Newbery Award, not a you know winner winner for the year, but an honor book. Um, but I've talked to you by, by, about. I've talked to you about Kate DiCamillo, so I wanted to make sure I added this review on there for you. Um, Opal's dad is a preacher, and he does allow her to keep the dog, but he's not very happy about it. But the book is really about that friendship between this girl, um, her dad, and Winn-Dixie. It's a beautiful little story. If you have not read it, pick it up and read it. It's a fast read. It's an enduring read. Um, it's a lovely read. Speaking of that, also right now I'm reading Coyote Sunrise and I am almost finished. I think it's The Remarkable Life of Coyote Sunrise. Um, I'm almost finished with that. So I will need to talk to you about that and Daisy Jones and The Six when I get back. I'm gonna have to do a very quick video um, and wrap up some of those because those are two books I'm gonna definitely need to talk about. Um, so uh, that being said, pick up D. Camillo's. I've talked to you about The, the Tale of Despero um, and some of her other ones, but I wanted to make sure that I added that the because of Winn-Dixie. If you have a child who I would say starting about fourth grade needs to do some summer reading, this would be a fabulous one that they can finish before school starts. It's a fun one that you could sit down and read with them at night too. And it's kind of summery because it takes place in Florida. I think I've also talked to you about Dee Camillo's um, Flora and Ulysses. That was a Newbery Award winner. Um, maybe 2015. So she's definitely an author that if she writes it and puts it out there, I'm gonna read it because she is a beautiful writer. 
So in addition to those two new berries, the other section that sits right up there, am I pointing in the right place? Right here. These are my book of the month books. Um, I love these editions. See this book of the month right here. I am looking for that when I go to the thrift store. I'm not a book of the month subscriber. I just can't justify buying books retail right now um, every month. Like I do buy them from time to time when I need something, but um, I just can't justify that. And I'm a big library user. I mean, like I said, I am a librarian by trade. Most of my books I get from the library, either audio or eBooks, or I stop by and borrow some books. Um, and then I thrift most of my other books, but God, these are beautiful additions. And someday, maybe for Christmas one year, um, someone will gift me that book of the month um, subscription because I think it is fabulous. Uh, several years ago, I know I mentioned this before, but I realized that I, because I was a high school librarian, I was reading all YA um, and a couple of years ago, I'm like, you know what? I need to be reading some modern fiction. I'm out of the loop talking to adults <laughs> about adult books, adult fiction. Um, so I have really tried to do that. And this is one that I read and really enjoyed. Um, it is An American Marriage. And I picked it up thrift not too long ago, I do believe. And I realized that I didn't put a review out there for that. So my Goodreads review is August of 2019. Um, a former student of mine recommended this and I read it and I think at the time I read it um, probably an ebook if I'm not mistaken and then I picked up a copy of it later but it's a very heartfelt thoughtful read um, I feel like it's a little more serious than some of your book of the month books it's a little darker um, it is realistic fiction but it's good it's really really good it focuses on the fact that life is not simple it's not always linear um, what we think is going to happen, how we plan our life in the life stages might not happen, and what you are faced with you could never have imagined. That is the story of this American marriage. Celestial and Roy have a story. It's going to break your heart. I'll tell you ahead of time it's going to break your heart um, because it's a story that really shows the importance of your past, the necessary importance of your presence, and looking into your future. It's how they're all weaved together to make your story. There are a lot of tough choices in this book. I highly, highly recommend it. It's super thoughtful um, and it is heartbreaking. It says on the back here that this was a February 2018 book of the month selection, so that's interesting. Um, but I have a number of the book of the month books and I just, I enjoy reading those and they are definitely ones that I really like to put on my bookshelf because they're beautiful. Now, another book of the month book that I think I've talked to you about, but I want to throw it out there because I don't think I gave it a full review. Celeste Ning's Everything I Never Told You. We did it with my book club. Um, and I do have a copy of it, but it's not a book of the month copy. Um, and maybe, is it not a book of the month, but it's by, maybe it was Celeste Ning's um, Little Fires Everywhere that was a book of the month. That's what it is. Celeste Ning's Little Fires Everywhere was a book of the month book that I talked to you about. Um, and so when I was shelving, I usually try and shelve authors together. So if you're a Newbery author, your Newbery goes up that, but any of the other books that you have go with those so that I keep the authors together. And I think that's why I was doing this one is because um, her Little Fires Everywhere was book of the month. I don't have a copy of that, but I have a copy of her Everything I Never Told You. And I wanted to make sure that I talked to you just a little bit about that. It, um, Again, it's heartbreaking. It's a heartbreaking story. Our book club read it and talked about it. It was one of our better discussions because there are just a number of things in that book that you could talk about and that people feel differently about. Um, there is a marriage. There are Chinese American dad um, and the daughter then is a, uh, is a Chinese American daughter and she struggles with the pressures of her life um, that are put on her by society and by her parents something happens, um, she's pushed too far. And then her story gets confusing. We're not really sure what happened. She disappears and then they have to kind of piece things together. And then you find out that the family has had some struggles. They are unable to accept what the police are telling them think happened. They can't, they can't accept that that was their daughter's story. Um, or that they might have had any part in her making those sorts of decisions. So you go back and you see each of their stories and kind of how that family functioned. There are other children in the family, so you see their stories. Um, 
it's good, it's dark, it's a good read. Um, I also read her Little Fires Everywhere, which was the book of the month, and I think I've talked to you about that one too. <clears throat> it was our book club read for November of 2019. Um, and again, gave a lot of talking points because it's very, it's a very complex modern novel. Um, so realistic fiction, dark again, um, and complicated family story, if that's the kind of book that you like. So everything I never told you and Little Fires Everywhere, are very complicated family stories. You know that in Little Fires Everywhere that you're headed towards a train wreck and you can't stop it and you're worried for the characters. So it is a page turner. Um, everything I never told you is a little slower. One of the things that I really like in my books is at the end of the book, it doesn't have to be a happy ending by any means, like the ending in this, um, it's not like everybody gets back together and everything turns out great. That does, that's not the purpose of this novel. It's the story of their growth. But in my books, I really like to know that in the end that everybody's going to be okay. Like they've grown as a person, their relationships have grown. If relationships aren't mended, then I feel like everybody's going to be okay, that they're making progress, that they're going to be happy. They found their passion. I really like those kinds of stories. I like that kind of ending. Um, and I, I'm saying her name is Ning. I'm pretty sure that's right. But she, I don't think that she's interested in me feeling like everybody's going to be okay in the end. <laughs> so she's not an author. She's probably not one of my favorite authors for that um, reason. I probably worry a little bit um, more than I should about her characters being okay in the end. Because I think she's just trying to tell us the story of how they got there. Um, but I do recommend both of her books. All right, so I think that catches us up on the Newberry and the Book of the Month so I can shelf those. I am trying to get those bookshelves in order this summer, and I tell you, uh, I can spend a whole day in here moving books around and pulling them out and making sure that they're on the list that I've talked to you about because that's my whole goal is to talk to you about all the books that are in here that I've read um, and then talk to you about books that I want to read. So between doing both of those things, it's like constant movement. I'm okay with that. It's a very organic library. So the next section that I have, I have a post-it that says that I have added reviews of these books um, and that I just need to talk to you a little bit about them as I'm putting them on there. So I talked to you about Will Grayson, Will Grayson, John Green and David Levithan. Um, and I mentioned this book and then I realized I didn't have a review out there for it. It's called The Lover's Dictionary. It is a novel. I know in the last video I'm like, is it a novel? Is it nonfiction? It is a novel. It is a love story told um, through the dictionary. So each letter is a word, and then the word tells you part of their story. <clears throat> I just opened it to happenstance. It's a noun. You said he wasn't even supposed to be at the convention, but one of his coworkers had gotten sick, so he was filling in at the last minute. He wasn't supposed to be at the bar when you went there with Toby, you told me, as if that in some way made it better, that fate hadn't planned it weeks in advance. God, that's kind of a darker one. Let's find another one. Breach. I didn't want you to know who he was or what he did or that it meant anything. Hold on. So it's a little darker than I remember, but how about this one? Persevere, verb. Those first few weeks after you told me, I wasn't sure we were going to make it. After working for so long on being sure of each other, sure of this thing, suddenly we were unsure again. I didn't know whether or not to touch you, sleep with you. Finally, I said, it's over. You started to cry and I quickly said, no, I mean, this part is over. We have to get to the next part. So I don't remember it being quite that dark. <laughs> Isn't that funny? But um, I loved it. I just think it was super original. I love David Levithan's work. Um, he is a gay man. He does write with gay characters. And again, that's just not something that I've had a lot of um, experience reading. And so when I hear that story, I just think it's, it's unique and I'm glad that he is writing for all of us. This is another one of those novels where we don't know the narrator's name. So that would be an interesting list. You know, when I said like, Rebecca, you don't know the narrator's name. And um, I feel like there's a couple here lately that I've read that are like that. They never say the name. And until someone points it out to me, I don't even seem to notice. But highly recommend The Lover's Dictionary. So I know I've kind of mentioned the Hunger Games series, but not really all of them. So I wanted to kind of catch up a little bit there. I reviewed the Hunger Games in 2018 on Goodreads. 
<clears throat> last summer I did a big long video on the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, which is the prequel to The Hunger Games. But I didn't have a review out there for Catching Fire, so I'm gonna catch you up on that one. And I didn't have one out there for Mockingjay, so it's kind of weird. Like I talked to you about them, but I didn't have reviews out there. So I caught up on those reviews. Um, I don't feel like I need to do a whole lot on reviewing the Hunger Games for you. There are 5,000 videos out there for that, and most of you have probably already read that series anyway. But if you had not continued to read um, the one that did come out last summer, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, I would highly recommend doing that. It's probably been my favorite out of the series. Um, so you can go back and watch that video too, but um, I just think that Collins, when she was writing The Hunger Games, was writing a series for young adults. And when she came back and did The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, she was just writing from her heart, like what she wanted to say. Um, so it revisits some of the themes from The Hunger Games, but she doesn't, I feel like she just doesn't feel like that she has to rush through and make a fight and have a revolution, that she is dealing with some of the backstory. And I really appreciated that. So just remember Hunger Games North America is rearranged into Panem. There's a capital, there are districts, the districts are struggling. Every year they must send two tributes, a male and a female, to the capital to compete in the Hunger Games. Um, and it's a fight into the death. So it is horrific um, and you feel for them. The whole dynamics of that um, game, the way that society is set up is horrifying. But we meet Katniss Everdeen, we meet PETA, um, and then the, in the first book, we see we get introduced to all of that. Um, and then in the second book, they have to go back and basically do like a tour. Where did I do with it? They have to do like a victory tour um, because they won the first Hunger Games, spoiler alert. <clears throat> but they have to partake in another round of those Hunger Games. And they're just, they're horrified like that this is going to be what they have to do. They have no control over what they have to do. So uh, we get to know President Snow a little bit in that second one in Catching Fire and um, Katniss gets a little more stealthy and starts a revolution. And then that third book is really that revolution. Um, they survive the Hunger Games, but now they're tossed into a war that their world has started. Katniss has um, started this revolution and people are just tired of taking the rules as they are set out by the capital. These people that are well fed and clothed and doing just fine. And then out in the districts, they're starving to death and struggling to survive. So um, super, super good series. I suggest the whole series. Um, and then I specifically say, if you've read the series, go back and do the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes because it is well worth it. So I added those reviews out there for Mockingjay and Catching Fire. Um, I've talked to you about Dan Brown, numerous, numerous videos. I know in the last one is when I did um, Breaking the Da Vinci Code. I talked to you about that nonfiction one. Uh, it, I reviewed the Da Vinci Code back in 2019. I reviewed Inferno back in 2013. Gosh, I can't believe it's been that long. Um, but I had just added that review last month to Breaking the Da Vinci Code. Um, I read The Lost Symbol earlier this year in March and reviewed that one for you. Um, but I did not have one out there for Angels and Demons. So I added that one and I wanted to talk to you just a tad about that too. Um, I did after I knew that I needed to add that review, I went and found the movie and watched the movie. Um, and it's good, Angels and Demons is good. It's the first one in the Robert Langdon series. Um, and the movie is good, but they did put it out after the movie of The Da Vinci Code. And so I think that it shows because Da Vinci Code, I loved the book. It's the first one that I read, even though it is what the third, sorry, it's the second Robert Langdon book, but um, it's the first one that I had read. And then I went back and read Angels and Demons and then continued. I will read every Dan Brown book because I really enjoy his writing. I love that it's a page turner. I can always count on um, wanting to read I was just wanting to sit down and read like I will go and hide so that I can get in some time it is very easy for me to hit my goal of 100 pages a day or reading for an hour if I'm reading a Dan Brown book so I really I really enjoy those and I will read all of his um, 
The first one is Angels and Demons. The second one is the Da Vinci Code. The third one is the Lost Symbol. The fourth one is Inferno. And then I did that other one, Breaking the Da Vinci Code, for you in the last video, which is a nonfiction walkthrough. Here's the Da Vinci Code and how it lines up with what religion believes about these things that he put in his book, his fictional book, which I talked about in the last video. Um, so I do want to read his other ones and I have one of his other ones. Which one do I have? I have one of his other ones on my short list. I just don't seem to have it in my hand. But his, his other one is definitely on my short list. He's read, or he has written more than I've read and I would like to read all of his books. The next one up for me is called The Origins and I have that paperback, so definitely going to be reading that one. So um, the one that I threw the new review out there for is Angels and Demons and I haven't talked to you a whole lot about that one. Um, but it seems to take a little bit longer to get in the story in Angels and Demons for me. Um, but there's a physicist, her name is Victoria Vitra. Something happens in her physics lab, something is stolen. They bring in Robert Langdon. They know that he specializes in this information. He's been looking to get access to some of the um, documents in the in Vatican City that they won't give him access to. So when this happens, they invite him to come in and help solve this um, crime that is currently happening. Uh, and in doing that, you get a lot of information about Vatican City and how we name the next Pope. Super interesting. Just like the other Dan Brown books, a lot of information in there that you might have to look to see if it's true or not, but it's interesting. I really like how he sets it up. Um, you can kind of call these speculative novels because it's kind of a what if you have, like here's how we name a Pope, but what if this happened? Like given this set of procedures that we follow every time, what if this happened? Then what would happen next? So I really like those. So the next one up for me is The Origins, and I also uncovered, I think, a couple more nonfiction ones that I put on my short list. So I added a review out there for 10 Little Indians by Agatha Christie. I've talked to you a lot about Agatha Christie, probably in almost every video, um, but I didn't have a review out there for Crooked House, and I know I've talked to you about that. So added that one. Also went back and watched the show. Just You know, it's another one that um, I know right now you're like, she said she wasn't watching a lot of television this summer, and she's already mentioned like four series she's watched. But especially like with Crooked House, I've already seen it. So I will turn it on in the background when there's something else that I have to do, like I'm paying bills or I'm updating documents or I'm cleaning out my email. So um, I've already seen it, but I watched it again because it was so good. I've also mentioned to you that there is a new podcast that I'm listening to. It's called All About Agatha Podcast, um, and I am enjoying it. I, it's, uh, I think about how um, the other podcast that I listen to from time to time, and it's um, Jessica, uh, the one about Jessica Fletcher, uh, uh, Murder, She Wrote, the Murder, She Wrote podcast, where they uh, watch an episode and then they do a podcast all about the episode. That's how the Agatha, All About Agatha podcast is. Um, so I've tried to go through and listen to the ones that have to do with the books that I've read, the Agatha Christie books that I've read. Um, and it's just super interesting, the take on them. And then they also basically do what I do. They talk about the books, but they also talk about the movies. Um, and I really enjoyed it. Like that is definitely a podcast that I will continue doing. I am really thinking about, um, you know, next year. <laughs> Um, I don't even know if I'll wait till next year, really diving in, making a plan about Agatha Christie and reading all of her books, watching all of the shows, just because I really, really enjoy them. I find them very cozy and comforting and, um, and nice and heady so that it's not just really light, forgettable mysteries. Like I'm thinking about them. I'm trying to solve them and she's really good at keeping me until the end guessing. So the Crooked House is on Roku. If you have Roku, you can search for it there. And it's a very well done. I love the movie. I think it's super well done. But, um, and I've talked to you about Crooked House before. There's a family, there's an old patriarch. There are numerous people that are living there. His children, his sister, um, nephews, like there are just all these people that are living there. And he basically has all the money. So when he dies, and you're pretty sure he's been murdered, there are a number of people who might want to see him gone. Um, and so you have to, you know, they bring in, is it a Her? I think it's a Hercule Poirot, is it? Mm, not sure about that. No, this is not a Marple or a Poirot novel, but it is a classic Christie, a classic Christie mystery. And Christie just does a fabulous job of going through the list of characters 
and saying here's their motive and here's why they could have done it and here's how they might have been able to do it or not been able to do it. Um, and she just moves through those characters. It's fabulously done. I love it. I know I've talked to you about The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime by Mark Haddon, but I wasn't sure if I showed you I had, you know, I picked up a copy for the classroom and a copy for um, home. Um, so I just wanted to kind of review that and I added that review after talking to you. So I'm pretty sure I talked to you a little more in depth about this book in one of the other videos, but I didn't actually have a review out there, so I wanted to make sure I did that. I think probably because it was in like a book haul, so I picked it up and talked to you about it, and then I'm like, there's no review out there. <laughs> um, so I read this back in 2004. Um, so I, I read it a long time ago. Is it really 2004? Gosh, that seems like so long ago. Yeah, it came out in 2003, read it in 2004, um, and it's so good. So it's a, I'm going to call it a mystery. Um, it's told from the point of a view, point of view of a young boy who suffers with, um, autism. So that comes through in the formatting of the book and the way that he's telling the story. And it is so heartwarming. Um, it's heartbreaking because he is trying to wrap his head around some things that have happened. You can see on the front, um, his neighbor's dog was killed. So he's trying to deal with that. And then things that he finds out along the way don't fit into the way that he thinks about things. So he's got to deal with that. But super, super good. Christopher John Francis Boone is the main character's name in here. He's not a fan of people. He is a fan of prime numbers. Um, and he is going to figure out why things in his world are not as they should be. He's very logical. And when Wellington, the neighbor's dog, is found murdered, that is not something that should logically happen. So this is a very unique journey through, um, you know, a Sherlock Holmes type figure who is also dealing with that autism and seeing it through the eyes of him. All things must be explainable, but unfortunately it does take him to some family secrets that he has a hard time dealing with. It is a funny book. I know it doesn't sound like it's funny, but it's a very funny book. It is sad and tragic at the same time, but it has a very dark humor. Mark Haddon, um, he has another book that I read. Ooh, um, something like A Spot of Bother, I think, that I also enjoy. I think our book club did this one, and then I read A Spot of Bother, and a couple of others did too, and I'm the only one who liked A Spot of Bother, but it's the same kind of thing where it's um, there's something that's happened the guy's trying to deal with it. It's very dark. It's humorous, but it's dark humor. Um, so different kind, different kind of book. It's not going to be for everybody, but I really like this book. It also gives you a certain kind of empathy for someone who maybe doesn't see the world as we see it. And um, they are forced to have to deal with some very difficult things. I've talked to you about Neil Gaiman's um, Coraline, but I did not have a review out there for that. So I did post a review of that. Um, he is in my list of Newberry authors. So I know I've talked to you about Coraline, but I didn't actually have a review there. So it's a very spooky tale um, for children, but Neil Gaiman makes it work. I don't know how he does it, but his books are so spooky and he does read or he does write for young readers as well as he has some adult books. Coraline is a book for all ages. This little girl's family moves to England to a flat, and while she's exploring her new flat where her family has moved, there's a secret door that one day opens and leads to another apartment across the way, and there's another family there, um, and they would like for Coraline to stay with them, but there are some weird things going on. Like, there are some children there who seem to not be able to leave. Um, the eyes are replaced with buttons. There are family pets that same thing. They have buttons for eyes. It's weird. It's a very creepy tale, but it's a good one. So maybe add that to your fall reading list. Coraline must choose between her ordinary life with her ordinary parents or this fantasy life with this, these parents that don't quite add up. I mentioned the book Orphan Train and talked to you a little bit about that one in a previous video, but I did not have a review, so I added a review for that. For those of you who like Sarah's Key, which I talked to you about in the last video, I think you would really like Orphan Train. It is a historical novel, um, historical fiction novel. Um, it's by Christina Baker Klein. I feel like I've read something else by her too. I have another book by her called Sweetwater that's on my short list. But Orphan Train is really a good story of the friendship and it tell of a friendship between um, um, 
a lady, an older lady today, like modern, and then her story back when she was younger. And there's a teenager today that's trying to help her sort through some of her belongings. And that's how she finds out this elderly woman's story of what she went through to get to where she is today. And they have a budding friendship. Um, they have very similar stories and very different ways. They were, they are both orphans of different ages. Um, you know, the orphan train was a very um, historical event that happened and that's why this woman was an orphan when she was young um, and she's now 80 or 90 years old. And then the girl that comes to help her as an orphan, she's gone through the foster system. She never has a good experience. She's, you know, helping her out for community service. And then both of them find out that they are very similar. And they help each other grow to what they need next. It starts out in New York City back in like 1929. This is where Vivian's family immigrated to the United States. Things did not go like they expected. They end up having to move around a little bit and then she ends up moving around on this orphan train. She goes to Minnesota in the 1930s to be taken care of by another family. And then we get the story um, of common day Molly who lives in Maine where Vivian has settled and she's now like a 90 year old woman. Um, and they both are dealing with being orphans. Super good, highly recommend it, Orphan Train. I don't know what happened there. I didn't actually talk to you about the 10 Little Indians by Agatha Christie. Um, I think this is an interesting one because it did have a different uh, title when it was originally pu published that would not be okay now. Um, and then they published it in the United States as, and then there were none, so you might know by that. That's a very popular play by high schools. And then um, now it is 10 Little Indians. So you might wanna look that up, not gonna go there but I think it's interesting how we change, um, how society changes what we're okay with naming something or not naming something. Um, but definitely would be a derogatory uh, term. We would probably not have published that. What is this like 1939 in America is that title. But um, this is a really interesting one. It also plays out well on film, but it's the story of these 10 people being called to this mysterious island for different reasons, they've all received this letter that says, um, you know, I'm inviting you here and it's, it could have a different person that's inviting them there and they all seem to kind of know who this person is, but they're not sure. But each of them, it, it's not all by the same person. Then they get there and that person is not there to greet them. They're gonna spend the weekend there and then one by one they start dying. Um, so being killed, being murdered. Um, but it's a great high school play when it gets put on and uh, it's a great read. This is number 24 in her series. Supposedly, this title is the world's best-selling mystery. Super good, highly recommend it. Um, in the last video, I talked to you about Masterclass. I know I've talked to you in a number of videos, but last one I talked to you about and I said, hey, I, I've done a couple of Masterclasses. I did one by Bobby Brown. I did one by David Sedaris. Um, I'm finishing that one up now. I did one by um, The Negotiator, something boss. Um, I did one by Neil Gaiman, um, but I thought, you know what, I know I own a Bobby Brown book and I don't know that I have a review out there, so I did. This is the one that I have, Bobby Brown, um, Bobby Brown's Beauty Evolution. I also have read Bobby Brown's Teenage Beauty. I have a copy of that in the high school library, so I read that too. So I put reviews out for both of those. I highly recommend Masterclass. Um, I've had it for two years. I've done probably five or six um, different uh, classes in it. The classes each have sections. Oh, I did one this summer on um, plants, growing plants, gardening. It was super good. Um, so I'll put all those in there, but highly recommend Masterclass and highly recommend Bobby Brown's um, Beauty Evolution. It's a great book with just good information about how your beauty evolves over time. Bobby Brown is a well-known makeup artist um, and she just walks to you through beauty care, health, and then how your makeup may change over time. So I really like this one. Both of the books um, that I've read by her have been expertly photographed. The way that they're set up, are, it's beautiful. It's really well done. And has really good information, like usable information in it. The Teenage Beauty one looks very much like this. And um, <clears throat> in both of the books, in the aging one and in the teenage one, I feel like Bobby Brown does a great job of saying, hey, whoever you are, you need to work on that. You don't need to change your nose. You don't need to change your skin color. You know, you just need to 
figure out what your areas are and then how to highlight your assets and accept who you are. So I really like that about her. That's her story and in Masterclass that comes, that comes across too. She does all different kinds of skin types um, and just shows, shows you how to accentuate your strengths and accept who you are. So I had uh, I picked up a copy of Left Behind for um, school and then one for here. And then I've read the first three. The third one is Nikolai. Um, but I, again, I didn't have an actual review out there for some reason. So I bet I read it back in, um, no, that's not true. <laughs> I had a review out there for Nikolai back in 2020, but I did not have one out there for Tribulation Force, which is the second one or for um, Left Behind. So I added those two reviews. I know I've talked to you about those in the other videos. So I added reviews for all three of those. Um, just to recap, it is definitely a story of the end days as the Bible puts them out there, as um, religion is telling you that in the end there will be an apocalypse. Um, so it walks you through those from a biblical sense. Um, I wanna say there's 12 or 13 books in the series. It's very long. But when I was putting stuff out there on social media about those, everyone said that the series continues to be really good. So I'm going to stick with it. I've read the first three. I need to start on the fourth one. Um, but I started reading the series back in 1999 uh, and I picked up the last one in 2002. So definitely need to get back on the train for that one. Um, I found it an entertaining, obviously a horrific series but it is entertaining, it's easy to read. I like to read something and then go back and try and figure out where they're getting that from to see if I think that that's biblical or not. Um, but it it is, in the first book, it takes a little bit of time to like lay out the whole story, I feel like, and then it gets faster after that. The second book, Tribulation Force, picks up after the first book where they really figure out what has happened here and that they are going to have to live through the next seven years of tribulation. Um, so it sets up that seven years of tribulation and lets you know, like, here's what's coming. And then with Nikolai, that third book, then it's the rise of the Antichrist. Like this guy who looks like he's going to help everybody who's coming in is not what he seems. So I'm going to pick up that series again. I would say they're three out of five, four out of five when I'm reading them. They're page turners. So I do need to just pick that back up. And I added those reviews on there for you. And then the last one that I didn't have a review out there for, and I know I've talked to you about Sharon Draper, um, Out of My Mind. So I added that review. This is such a good book. I know I picked it up in a recent book haul. Um, the main character has cerebral palsy, and at the beginning of the book, she is not able to communicate. She doesn't have any, any way of communicating, so they think that, you know, they put her in a little, like, preschool class. It's awful. Um, but once she finds a device where she is able to communicate, they realize that she is super smart and she starts actually making friends and socializing with people her age. Um, and then something happens where that group of people, they're just not quite where they need to be with being able to handle someone who has disabilities and something happens. It's a super good book, highly recommend it. So I put that review out there. Um, and I'm just telling you, put it on your reading list. Sharon Draper, I've read several of her books. I highly recommend her. So the next section is the book haul. I can't remember where all of these came from, but they're ones that I've picked up since the last time that we've been on here. So I'll do my best to talk to you about those. Um, and then before I do that, this is that one that I was telling you that I'm currently reading, The Remarkable Journey of Coyote Sunrise by Dan Gimmenhart. Um, I can't tell you how many people have been reading this book and saying this is fabulous. I plan to pitch it to my book club at our next meeting. Um, and that would be a really good video is if I um, maybe talk to you about how we go through that process of picking books for our book club. Hmm. I'll plan that video and do that when I get back from vacation. But um, I'm almost finished with this and I absolutely love it. I think it really will lend itself to our book club discussion, but I'm not going to talk to you about this one yet because I'm not finished. I borrowed this one from my friend Stephanie. She doesn't have her name on it yet. We never took talk bookmarks in here. I don't think I've mentioned those. Here's one that I made a long time ago and uh, it's got a little coffee cup that says happy and says be with those who help your being and it's like coffee stained. I love that little thing. I've had it forever. 
what do you use for a bookmark? A lot of, I, it's terrible. I'm a librarian and a lot of times I just pick up a post-it note or whatever's laying around and shove it in there, which is terrible um, because I have bookmarks, but whatever. So um, some books that I have picked up here in the last little bit. I got this from the library and then I really liked it. Um, so whenever I was unpacking everything from the school year, I had two Amazon gift cards for my students throughout the year for um, Teacher Appreciation Week and Christmas maybe, or end of the year, I don't know. So I went ahead and purchased this one from Amazon. It's the Infographic Guide to Grammar, um, and it is so good. So you can see here, like um, this will be a really good one to throw up onto the screen when I'm going over particular things of grammar. Um, and it just makes a, another visual. I need to be a little more visual this year. I am very old school, so I need to be a little more visual this year. I'm gonna work on that. So did get that one from Amazon. I thought I had already mentioned this one in one of my book hauls, but it's not in my notes. So I'm making sure to mention it to you now. Uh, this is another one that I bought with like Christmas money. Um, Notorious RBG, The Life and Times of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It's by Aaron Carmen and Shauna Knix. We're gonna go with that, but uh, on my short list. Um, so I don't know how it didn't end up in my notes. So just, I'm rectifying that now. I did buy that back in like January with my Christmas money. Somewhere along the line, I picked up Beautiful Creatures. I have already read this. It is by Cami Garcia and Margaret Stoll. It's a young adult series. Um, and I've already read this, but I did not have a copy of it. So I picked this up and remember in my book haul, I don't normally do the whole reviews on those. So I'll set them aside and then add them to reviews and then talk to you a little bit more in depth. So this should be a lot quicker. <laughs> uh, I picked up a copy of Gary Paulson's Winter Dance. I have a copy here. I'm going to look real quick. I have a copy here that I read earlier. Yeah, I do. So this will be my school copy. Um, and this is an easy one to recommend. It is a nonfiction story of um, Gary Paulson, the young adult author, talking about running the Iditarod. Super good. I've talked to you about that one before. Um, so pretty sure my review's already out there for that. Um, finally, this is like my all time favorite book. Like I've read a thousand something books. Um, and this is my all time favorite book, Daisy Faye and the Miracle Man by Fanny Flagg. It's super funny. Um, it tells her story from the time she's like 13 through like maybe 19. And it's just, I love it. So I know I've talked to you about this one before, but I've never had a copy. So I picked up a copy finally. I picked up this copy of a series that I've read another book um, in the series. It's Jen Mc, McKinley's um, hmm, Library Lovers Mystery Series, Cozy Mystery Series. This one is called Hitting the Books. And it looks like it's number nine in the series. So I haven't read this one yet. This is the one I was telling you earlier, the Dan Brown that is next, and I actually picked up two copies at the thrift store. So I will have a copy for my library, and then I will put this one in my school library. No, I will put this in my school classroom. I picked up a copy of Jurassic Park. I've talked to you about Michael Crichton and Jurassic Park. It's one of my favorite series. I think it's super readable, fun science fiction. Um, so I picked up a copy of that. I picked up this copy of Henry Nowen's Discernment. I've read some of his other books and I really, really like him. So he is nonfiction. I would say spiritual because I'm not sure. Uh, it, oh, it's got on here, religion, Christian life, spiritual growth. So there's your genre um, because I can't remember exactly what his title is. He's a guide, a counselor, a spiritual counselor. So, you know, just interesting. And I've read a couple of his books and I really like him. So I picked that up at the thrift store. This was a good find. I'm gonna call this serendipity because um, I've been talking about Agatha Christie a lot. I like her, I like her shows. Um, and I was thinking maybe I want to like organize myself and like make my way through her backlist. And then I found this book at Half Price Books for $3. It's the Agatha Christie Companion, the complete guide to Agatha Christie's life and work. Um, so I'm thinking I'm gonna start it and I'm going to read her works and listen to the All About Agatha podcast. Um, I might wait until the new year to start this one, um, but huh, I was really, really excited about it. Let me see here. Here we go. So it lists all of the novels and it has the year that they were published beside of it. I love that. Um, there's an introduction about her life. It also talks about the plays that she has, um, what's on television, the films, the years that those films came out. Obviously there's a lot of new films there. Um, that I'm a little more familiar with, but I'm super excited about this book. 
um, and then maybe taking that on next year. That might be have, have to be like a separate endeavor than these YouTube videos, but super excited about that, that little find. Um, I talked to you about the Agatha Raisin series. I listened to the first two books in the series um, this summer. And then when I was at Half Price Books, all three of these books were there and they're $3 a piece. The Deadly Dance, As the Pig Turns, and Something Borrowed, Something Dead. So um, I think, that, yeah, that's number 24, number 22, and number 15. So obviously not in order, but I like this series and it's another cozy mystery series that I was going back and listening to some of the audios. So then I will just mix these in with listening to the audios. So super excited about that. And look, they're really pretty. They look like Easter eggs. <laughs> I've already talked to you about Kate Carlisle's little black book that she gives me for free. I'm one of her raters. You can get in on that if you go to her website and you um, look on her website, you can apply if there's an opening, then she will let you know. One of my friends ordered this one for me. It's Mentor Texts for grades 6 through 12, Teacher's Guide to Mentor Text. So I need to make my way through that. But honestly, until it gets time for August, like I don't even want to go there yet. My cousin, Deb, that I'm going down to visit for um, spring for spring break. I visited her on spring break and now I'm going down before school gets started. Um, she mailed me some copies of O Reader. This is a magazine that I mailed her one of the copies for her birthday um, and she picked up some back issues. So I'm reading those. And she also included two books, My Life with Bob, my book of books, and Making Masterpiece. I love Masterpiece Theater. So both of these I'm really excited and they're on my short list. And then I was asking, um, whenever I put out the review for the 28 days, uh, teach me in 28 days how to study the Bible one, and I wasn't thrilled with that, I had several comments of people who said, here's one that I really like. And my friend, my friend Gail Wise from um, high school, she suggested this author. It's Jen Wilkin, Women of the Word, How to Study the Bible with Both Our Hearts and Our Minds and no one like him, 10 Ways God is Different from Us and Why That's a Good Thing. I started reading this one already and I really, really like it. So I'm already uh, moving my way through that one. Super enjoy that one. So thank you for the recommendations. I love when people comment and give me actual recommendations. So when I don't like something, and it's the same thing, if I recommend a book and someone reads it and they're like, I didn't really like that. It's easy for me to say, what did you not like about it? Well, then maybe try this one. So thank you for your recommendations. And I was glad to pick those two up and I ordered those on Amazon. And then um, a coffee shop that I went to, which one? Good question. Um, over in Madeira, did I write it down? Nope, I don't know. Over in Madeira, I stopped at a coffee shop and they had to take one, leave one shelf. And I always keep um, a little stack of books in my trunk for when that happens. Uh, if I were to run across a little library or, you know, take one, leave one shelf and this was on there. So I took one in, dropped it off and took, and then I brought this one back out and this is, they wish they were us by Jessica Goodwin, good men. Um, they made this into a movie or a TV series that I haven't seen yet, but I remember telling my kids that it was going to happen at the beginning of last year. Um, so I'm glad to have a copy of this and look, it looks like a murder mystery, which I'm super happy about. So then three books that I picked up at my public library, this one wild um, and precious life. I may have mentioned these on the last video that I picked them up. So now I need to return them, but um, they're so good that they're ones that I'm going to want to borrow again or um, purchase because they're really, really good. And I want to take more time with them. But this one I've, I started, um, I did not finish, but I did start it and I really liked it. And then John Green's The Anthropocene Reviewed. I think my friend owns a copy of this, so I'll probably borrow her copy to make it through. Because again, I really liked it. I just didn't um, didn't have time to focus on those this week or this month. And then I picked up James Patterson's Murder of Innocence to look through it, and I didn't even get that one started. So I did pick those up from the public library, but I'll be returning those because they are due. All right, so that's the book haul. Let me move them. All right, let's do just a little bit of book news. I have not read Colleen Hoover's Verity, but it is really talked up a lot in the book world, so it's on my list. Um, but what I did not realize is it is self-published. So I get a newsletter from um, Indie Reader, and it came across my email, and it was like the top um, self-published books of the week or whatever. And Verity was on there, and I just it just piqued my interest because I was not I did not realize that that was a self-published book. Um, so adding that one to my short list. 
I follow Epic Reads and they had a great article on 16 booktubers to have on your radar in the new year. So follow me on social media and I definitely forwarded that one. Um, I am always out to learn more. Like I just started this during COVID to connect with my students and then I, you know, transitioned into this to where I am doing it for just my friends and adult and YouTube people, whoever's out there who wants to hear about it and not in a school setting. Um, and there's always more to learn. I mean, I feel like I've grown over all those videos, um, but there's definitely more that I need to know and how to make it more interesting for you. I'm always interested in that. So if you have suggestions for book booktubers that I should take a look at, let me know. But I've been working my way through that article of the 16 booktubers you should know. Some of them I already knew, um, and then some of them I had not. So I'm always just interested to see how everybody does this. The article does describe to you like what is booktube because every year whenever I do talk to the kids about, hey, if you're on YouTube and you like books, there is this whole different society called booktube. Here's what it is, here's how it works, and here are some people. Um, so I think that's nice that the article kind of describes that. Each of the um, YouTubers that they highlight, they've embedded um, one of their videos that you can watch and kind of see like, is it for you or is it not? Because I do realize like, I'm not gonna hit the interests of every person. Um, it's just if we read the same kinds of books or if you enjoy my voice or if you don't enjoy my voice, um, finding someone who has your sense of humor or is doing the videos like you wanna know about just the current or just the recently released or just a particular genre. Like you can find somebody who does videos that are going to strike your fancy. I had watched some of Jesse the Reader who's highlighted on there. He's been around a long time, I think. I've been watching the Peru's Project video um, channel for a long time. And then I just wanna check out all the ones that are on there. So I will attempt to link that video in the show notes. An author that I really enjoy is Michael Pollan. I have talked to you about some of his books before, The Omnivore's Dilemma and Food Rules. So I have already talked to you about both of these. Omnivore's Dilemma is a natural history of our four meals. So he talks to you about food, the evolution of food, nutrition, how we feed ourselves, that it's just interesting. It's nonfiction. And then he has this very condensed one, Food Rules and Eater's Manual that's illustrated that I've talked to you about. He has a new book out there. It's called, This Is Your Mind on Plants. So I am requesting that on my local libraries list. It's already out there. I saw Joe Rogan um, did a segment. I listened to that video or watched that video with him. And he's made the rounds on a couple of other talk shows or radio segments or whatever Michael Pollan has talking about this particular books and the effect that, that food has on our mind. Some of those are psychedelic. Um, he does talk about mushrooms and such, and you know, Joe Rogan's totally into um, talking about that. So it's just interesting. I like to hear him talk, and I've read several of his books. I feel like I've read another one by him too, um, and I just really enjoy him. I think he's very informative. Um, it kind of puts you in a different mindset of, hey, you might need to be paying attention about what you're putting in your body. I know I also have his book, Cooked, um, that I've not read before. It's on my shelf, so I need to put that on the short list but I would really like to read his new one about plants and what they do for our mind. I've talked to you about Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, as well as some of her or other ones, Oryx and Crank, I believe, um, that I have read. This is one of those books that I read in college with a class and I was just blown away at how great this book is. They made it into a series. I've talked to you about her several times. Um, she has a new book um, coming out this fall. It's some nonfiction essays, so that should be really interesting. That one's going on my list of um, books to request from the library. I believe it was last year I talked to you about the henna artist. This was a Reese's Book Club. Reese's Book Club actually sent me this book for free um, last year with another one. I can't remember. Black. I mm, can't remember what it was called. Something. I can't remember. But um, I love this book. This was really good. It's by Alka Joshi. Joshi. Alka Joshi. Let's put that one out there. And the second one in this series is being published. It's called The Secret Keeper of Jaipur, um, and they are calling this a trilogy. So this is the first one, The Secret Keeper is out now, and then the um, third one will be out later. It's not saying when that is, but that's on my list because I really enjoyed The Henna Artist, and I've already talked to you about that one. I've also mentioned Rainbow Rowl to you. I talked to you about attachments, um, and I know that I've mentioned this Simon, what's it called, Simon Snow series. It's kind of a take on an alternate Harry Potter 
like fan fiction. Um, it shows up in another book of Rainbow Rouse that I talked to you about. What's it called? Fangirl. That's the name of Rainbow Rouse's other book where we meet the two twin sisters that go to college and the one writes fan fiction and she is writing um, the fan fiction, the Harry Potter fan fiction, and that's where we meet Simon Snow. Um, so she pulled that out. She wrote Carry On and this is a new book in that series and I believe it finishes up the series, the Simon, S Simon Snow series. So that is out now. It's called Any Way the Wind Blows um, and it's the third one in that Simon Snow's series. So highly recommend her. Um, I don't know if I've ever told you, I actually uh, saw her in person um, at Books by the Bank. She was the featured art, uh, the feature author that year, I think. And uh, I was going into the restroom and she was washing her hands and it was so obvious that it was her. It was before she had gotten up to speak, but she was wearing this super colorful dress, just very rainbow rowl. Um, so she had on this cool necklace. It was like a telephone because um, what's that other book that she wrote? I can't remember, but um, has to do with the telephone. And it was this really cool necklace, just super cool experience. I love Rainbow Rowell. I love all of her books. Attachments is probably my favorite, um, where most of most of the people I would say like Eleanor and Park more. Um, but any book by her, and I think it's super interesting that she wrote a book within a book and then pulled that out and wrote a whole new series with that one. Ridiculous talent, ridiculous talent. I think I've talked to you about Paula Hawkins, The Girl on the Train. She has a new book out called A Slow Fire Burning. She writes great thrillers, so I'm looking forward to this one. I've only read a couple Stephen King. I think he's a super interesting guy, ridiculously talented, um, but he's a little creepy for me. So I've read The Green Mile. That's this one. Um, I'm pretty sure I've talked to you about that one. Um, and I've got reviews out there on that one. I've been reading his 112263. I'm almost finished. I have it in print. I listened to it on audio. I picked it up, laid it down, picked it up, laid it down. That's on my must be finished um, for the summer. So I'm going to try and do that one. I think I have the audio on my phone now. So maybe I can finish that one on the plane. But he has a new one out called Billy Summers. Um, so if you're a Stephen King fan, make sure you catch that. Julie Murphy, who I think I've talked to you about her book, Dumplin', which I really, really like. She's had several others. I know I've talked to you about some books that she's had that have been coming out, and she has a new one out called If the Shoe Fits. Hmm. Yeah, it's called If the Shoe Fits. Um, so might want to take a look at that if you're a Julie Murphy fan. Um, she does mainly do young adult fiction, but they're very good. I enjoy them. Riley Sager, who I've talked to you about um, the last time I lied. Da -da -da. Is that last time I lied? Yeah, the last time I lied. I also read Home Before Dark last year and talked to you about that one. Um, I read that one on NetGalley. Uh, he has a new one out called Survive the Night, which looks super interesting. Again, really good page turning thrillers. So, you know, look at that book. You can kind of already tell, but. Um, he also wrote Final Girls, and I haven't read that one. So just really think you're going to enjoy Riley Sager if you are a thriller and a thriller person and you just have not um, found one that's catching your interest. I don't know how these wouldn't. <laughs> so highly recommend Riley Sager. Gail Foreman, the author of If I Stay, has a new one out called We Are Inevitable. All right, so that does it for book news. I had some books to movies that I wanted to mention. Michael Shaven, Cavalier and Clay has been on my list to read forever. I have it in the high school library. I don't have a copy of it here. Um, I hear so much about him and I've just, I've not read him. Um, and they are turning that into a movie on Showtime. Obviously, book to movie news. I'm always talking to you about Agatha Christie. Um, I have on my short list, The Body in the Library. That's the next one I really want to read by her. Um, I just rewatched Murder on the Orient Express. Again, just put it on while I was doing something else. I'd seen it before, but I forgot how great it was. Um, mm, is that right, Murder on the Orient Express? I think I'm telling you the right one. Yeah, Murder on the Orient Express. It is on um, Spectrum Demand, so I just want to throw that out to you that that is out there if you have yet to see that one. Um, the Murder of Roger Ackroyd is on Acorn. They are doing a Death on the Nile. It's the movie sequel to Murder on the Orient Express. So you might want to get this one under your belt and watch that movie before that new movie comes out. Or if you've not yet or you've not yet read Death on the Nile like me, it's on my short list. And then I've been watching Agatha Christie's Miss Marple. It's on Acorn. 
I've also been watching um, James Patterson's The Zoo on Netflix. I'm almost finished with that. We watched it when it first came out forever ago, but I want to say there's five or six seasons, so it just felt like it was going on and on and on, but I do not let to, like to let like a series hang out there, so I've been finishing that series on Netflix. It's an easy one to turn on and walk in and out of the room. You can pretty much follow it like that. I told you that I just finished Daisy Jones and the Six, and then I saw that they are going to turn it into a movie. I think it's on... HBO, if I'm not mistaken, or a series even, which I can totally see how you could do that. This is such a good one. I will talk about it in the next video because I just finished it, but they are going to turn that um, onto film. Um, I did go back and rewatch The Birds on Peacock and Rear Window, um, which was on Prime. You can look on that on Prime. I shared an article that was um, on Entertainment Daily, the UK, and it was good crime dramas to watch if you um, were interested in Whitstable Pearl, if you watch that, because there just aren't that many. I want to say there's like maybe six episodes of Whitstable Pearl, and it was one that you just really fall in love, it, love with, and then it's, it's over. You know, and how long is it going to take for them to put out another series for that? But um, that was a really good article, and there are several that we've watched on there, and, it, and they are... Um, they're crime dramas that originated from the book. So again, I requested the Whitstable Pearl books um, from my library so that I could read some of those and see how they match up with how they put them onto film. Some of the others that come from books that we've enjoyed, we enjoyed uh, Rosemary and Pearl, Father Brown, Agatha Raisin, Queens of Mystery, Midsummer Murders, Death in Paradise. I'm still making my way through Shakespeare and Hathaway and the Agatha Christie's and I still need to try Grant Chester and Bleckley. So that's my list of those crime dramas that came from books. On my short list of what to watch, I still need to do The Woman in the Window. There never seems to be a good time to watch that kind of show. I finished Firefly Lane, so I need to put that one on and watch it. I still need to watch Rebecca. So that kind of wraps up the book news and the books and movies that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, there are a couple little cleanup things that I wanted to do. This is the one that I told you I have Sweetwater by Christina Baker Klein who did Orphan Train. So that's on my short list because I've not read that yet and I did really like Orphan Train. I um, thought I had already mentioned this to you but I didn't see it in my notes. So uh, Frederick Bachman who wrote A Man Called Ove which I love wrote uh, Bear Town. So that's on my short list. I would really like to read that one. Um, David Graham who did the um, Murders of the Osage, what's that called? Um, I already talked to you about his other book and they're getting, they're making it into a movie now with Leonardo DiCaprio. I'm super excited about it. Why can't I think of the title of it? But um, I have this book, it's a um, advanced reader copy called The Lost City of Z, A Tale of Deadly Obsession in the Amazon. But again, I didn't see it in my notes. I just wanna make sure that I mentioned that, that that's on my short list because I really liked his writing. Here are those two um, Dan Brown I have Exploring the Da Vinci Code and Discussing the Da Vinci Code. They're both by Lee Strobel and Gary Poole. So just two little paperbacks that I saw that I still had that are not on my I've already read them list. So I'll be flipping through those and add those to my list. If this one you can tell I took notes in it so I probably have already read it. So um, I'll go back and review on those and take a look at those. Um, and then Book Club. Where's my little book club book? Remember have a little book club book that I'm keeping track in that my friend Stephanie gave me. We have a student book club. This is our next read for that. It's called I Killed Zos Bonos by Kit Frick. Um, so that I will read during August so I can be prepared for that. And then our book club meets in August, um, maybe second or third week. And that is our planning session. We will be discussing the pioneers, which we didn't get to at our last meeting. And then Barbara King Solver's How to Fly um, a series of essays that I've already talked to you about. I reviewed it last year on Netflix or Netflix on NetGalley and really liked it. So maybe I'll do a little video on book clubs. I think that would be a really good one. Tell you a little bit of history about how I started that and how we've progressed and grown and changed things and some of the requirements that we have when we sit down at this next meeting and decide what we're going to read for the year. So um, that'd be a really fun one. I also really want to play with my iPad. I've got Procreate on there and I don't know how to use it. So <laughs> I'm taking it with me next week when I go to the beach. And um, I, you know, once I do one of these videos, it's like, I just want to get it edited and out there to you. And I don't know how to do those bells and whistles. So I need to tape a couple of little um, sections, different kinds of videos and then play with those so that I'm not so pressed for time. I also wanted to add this little book. 
I thought I'd already done this one too, but it's Henny Mankell, The Man on the Beach. It's a short story. It's like a little Noble X is what it's called, um, but that's on my short list too. And for some reason, I don't see notes here anywhere that's, that that's on there. All right, I'm stopping there with the book discussion. I don't have anything exciting in here other than unsweet tea. I did visit a number of coffee shop stops, so I will link that in the notes, but I did like Tag Cafe, which I've been to before, but it's over in Colerain and I love it. They do a fabulous job. Um, I went downtown to 1215 Coffee Bar. Right beside it is like a stationary paper store called Paper Wings or Angel Wings, Paper Wings, I think. Um, highly recommend it if you're a person who likes stationary pens, paper goods, it was amazing. Coffee Please is the name of that coffee shop in Madeira that has a take one, leave one shelf. So take a book with you, drop it off, pick something else up, take a little look-see, and the coffee was fabulous. I also visited Mad Llama in um, Madisonville. That was a fun one. And again, really good food and coffee. And then Proud Hound, where we've been taking um, Stella. I started to say Marina, God love her, rest her soul. But we've been taking Stella with us on these coffee shop stops. Um, this summer because most of them have outdoor seating so one of us can stay out with her go get our food come out and she's been really enjoying it so proud hound was fun a couple of podcasts that i did want to mention to you i've talked to you about the all about agatha christie so i'm linking that i highly suggest that you add that to your list there was a great one um, with an author, Michael Dobbs, who wrote a book called Watergate, The Tapes in the Fall of the Nixon White House. I'm probably gonna have to listen to his audio book if he reads it because it was super interesting. It was on fresh air. I've been listening to a new podcast called For Real Nonfiction. And um, it's another one that like I can just play it while I'm working around the house on something. And I just enjoy the conversation. I enjoy the two girls that are talking about it. They talk about um, nonfiction that they've read or that's coming up or newly published. And it's just super interesting. I really like that one. So I'm linking that one for you. Um, and don't forget Park Predators that I've mentioned in the past. They have new um, podcasts coming out every Tuesday. Super love it. Um, Sasquatch Chronicles. I'm doing a lot of that this summer for some reason. I don't know. They're just really good storytellers. Once again, I am happy to be your friendly librarian and to book chat with you, discuss these books, um, hopefully give you some ideas of some things that you want to request from your library um, or a, you to do e-reader, an audio book, and just fill in some of that time where maybe you just, you know, again, you just really like me. You like to hear people talk about books or you like to listen to books. It's a great storytelling way. Um, so if that's for you, I am happy to be your friendly librarian. Thank you for coming by and letting us chat about books. Don't forget to check out, I will form that book club on Facebook and I will link that. All of the books that I talk about on my YouTube um, book chats, I try and review on Goodreads. So either it's there or it's in the loop to be getting on there. Everything from my Goodreads is pushed over to Facebook, so let's be friends. Remember that you do not need to purchase any of these books. Just join your public library and request them. You can download either Overdrive or Libby, whatever works for you, and get those on your phone or your personal device. I have all the links below for my social media, so let's be friends. Hit the subscribe and like button so that I know that you're enjoying the recommendations and all the book chat. Comment, email, message me. Let me know what you're reading, what you're looking for, and keep in touch, folks. Enjoy.